Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. At this time, I will call into open session this meeting of the Arlington ISD uh, Board of Trustees on November 1st. Happy November, everybody, 2018 at 7.12 p.m. Thank you, everyone, for being out here this evening with us. Uh, I'd like to start our meeting uh, with the opening ceremony. Please join Mrs. Mays in leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Please be seated and also silence all cell phones and electronic devices uh, you may have to avoid disruptions to those around you. And also, if you would please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. All right, so first on our agenda, if you can't tell, is a, a presentation by this uh, a student performance by the district-wide junior high choir, Ms. Bordeaux. The AISD junior high choirs have been recognized across the nation for their excellence in performance. Our choirs have been recognized by the Texas Music Educators Association as invited honor choirs and have also been recognized by the American Choral Directors Association with honor performances at both the Southwestern ACDA Conference and the National ACDA Conference. These honors are the result of inspired teaching and learning by both our students and directors. Tonight, the district-wide junior high choir will be performing Gloria Deo by Johnson. This performance is under the direction of Wes Harsha, Choral Director at Shackleford Junior High.
thank you, students, so very much. That was fantastic. I uh, appreciate your time and dedication, all the extra effort that goes into this, not just at your own home campuses, but as a district-wide. And Mr. Harsha, thank you. Uh, a great job to you and, and all of our, our choir directors uh, around the uh, community. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. Thank you to all the parents out there supporting your students as well. You're more than welcome to stay for the entire meeting if you like. <laughs> no takers. Very good. So moving on, uh, next on our agenda is the uh, Student of the Month. Um, we're honoring a, a, a Bowie High School student this month, so uh, if uh, we could have uh, Principal Lizardo, please uh, come forward. Tell us who you have. President Reich, Dr. Cavazos, member of the boards, thank you so much for this opportunity to recognize a wonderful Bowie student. I received lots of nominations, but I'm going to tell you the choice was very easy. Today, I would like to present to you Jada Williams. Jada is a senior who has attended Bowie for all four years. She's an avid student who started with us on the JV girls basketball team as a freshman and then easily transitioned into the varsity girls basketball team. Last year, she won the AISD Defensive Player of the Year for the girls basketball team. She volunteers at Mission Arlington every Thanksgiving where she delivers turkey and Thanksgiving food to deserving families. She also volunteers her time there um, during Christmas as well to help run Mission Arlington's Christmas store. She also spends time at homeless shelters to help put together bags full of hygienic products to deliver to those in need. Jada is an amazing young lady who is on track to graduate with a distinguished level of achievement, and she plans on attending Clark Atlanta University in Atlanta, Georgia next school year. She plans on being a teacher. She told me she wants to come back to Arlington to teach elementary. I would rather her come back to Bowie to teach high school. <laughs> now, even though she wants to be a teacher, I'll tell you, um, when I was still considering who to nominate, I visited her classroom doing an observation, and uh, the class was doing a debate. And I'll tell you, it was a pretty divided room. But by the end of Jada speaking, she had united that whole room on her side. So really, I'd like to say I'd vote for her whenever she intends to run for anything. Um, but of course, the choice is hers. So, but really, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Jada Williams. Well, good evening, Jada. What you have the mic. Uh, anything you'd like to say or anybody you'd like to acknowledge? Um, I wasn't really prepared to say anything, but I would just like to thank everybody that's been a part of this journey. And yeah. <laughs> thank you. you have <laughs> How about... Jada, how about, how about uh, family? You want to introduce your family that's here? OK. Of course, this is my principal, Ms. Lazardo, my mom, my little brother, and that's my grandmother, but I call her my two mommy. Oh, wonderful. Well, con congratulations. Uh, this is a, a very unique and special honor. Uh, this is something that uh, only one high school student at each high school gets the entire school year. So uh, it's a very special recognition. And uh, we're, uh, we're proud of and proud for you, uh, what you, what you're doing now and what you will be doing and when you come back to work here at Arlington ISD. Uh, before you uh, go anywhere, Dr. Cavazos and I would like to come down and, and present you with a couple of tokens, please. So, Jada, uh, this is a pin. You can see I'm wearing it. Dr. Cavazos is. Most of the trustees, uh, we wear these pins. Uh, they, these are our special pins that only we wear and that we present to those that are deserving of them that uh, make, make us proud and do great things as examples for the district. So, I'd like to present this to you uh, to, to keep. Uh, put it on a wall, wear it every day, whatever you'd like to do. Um, it's just a, a, a piece of, uh, of uh, significant bling that, that we 
uh, want to show our, our gratitude for you and everything that you are doing and uh, representing our district so well. Dr. Thank you. Dr. And Ralph Tata, this is just a memento for this evening and thank you so much for being so, such a wonderful student. You represent our students exceptionally well and you represent Bowie High School exceptionally well. I'm very proud. Thank you. Congratulations. Great students in Arlington ISD. All right, uh, moving on in the agenda is the consideration of administrative appointments. Uh, we have the Executive Director of Communications and Marketing, Principal for Rankin Elementary, Assistant Principal for Crouch Elementary, Assistant Principal for Hale Elementary, Dr. Klausos. Thank you, President Rice. I'd like to recommend the board appoint the individuals discussed in closed session for Executive Director of Communications and Marketing, Principal of Rankin Elementary, Assistant Principal for Crouch, Elementary and assistant principal for Hale Elementary is discussed in closed session. All right. Is there a motion to accept that recommendation? President Reich, I ask that we accept the administration's um, appointment of the um, individuals um, represented. Very good. Is there a second? I'll second. All right. Motion by Mr. Hibbs, second by Mr. Chaffa. Any discussion? Seeing none, please vote. over there, it's hiding on us. All trustees present vote in the affirmative. Congratulations, Dr. Cavazos. Thank you, Pres Thank you President Rice. Yes, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, our Executive Director of Communications and Marketing, Ms. Anita Foster. <laughs> Anita attended the University of Texas at Arlington for a Bachelor of Arts in Communication. Most recently, the Senior Director of Communications and Marketing with the Tarrant Area Food Bank in Fort Worth. Uh, has uh, worked as the Regional Chief Communications Officer in North Texas for the American Red Cross, Chief Development Officer, Director of Community Relations and Marketing, has also been a Director of Fund Development for Goodwill Industries and an Assistant Director of Fund Development and Public Relations. Anita, congratulations and welcome. Thank you. Dr. Reich, members of the board, Dr. Cavazos, I am new to your field, so I'm probably not going to do anything right tonight, but I'm going to start by saying thank you. This is incredible. And I will tell you a story that I shared uh, during a panel interview. I don't know how many people were in the room, maybe seven or eight, it felt like 700. Um, and someone asked me why I was looking to leave Tarrant Area Food Bank. And the answer to that is I wasn't. I was absolutely not looking to go anywhere. I've spent almost 30 years of my career in the nonprofit sector it has been incredible as a journey. When I went to Tarrant Area Food Bank after 20 years at the American Red Cross, it was to sleep at night <laughs> and to, to still be able to serve humanity. I work in a place that puts food on plates of hungry people. So no, I wasn't out there looking. But something showed up in my LinkedIn box one day and I opened it and it was this job description and it just washed all over me that I needed to look at this opportunity. And I shared this story with the team during my interview and I wanna share it with you. The reason this mattered so much is because of my history. I came from a family where I'm the first person to graduate from college. And the part of that reason was my grandma my grandma was uh, the sweetest, most endearing woman you'll ever meet, but she had no education. She made it to the fifth grade. 
And as I was a little kid growing up in Mansfield, which y'all know was a small town back then, um, she would always say to me over and over, get your education, get your, you go to school, you just go to school. She didn't really probably know what that really meant, but she knew enough to know it would matter in my future. My mother backed up those sentiments. And so even though all the odds were stacked against me, I went to school. I got through high school and I went to college. And when I was in college, my little grandmother from her fixed income would send me $25, $50 checks in the mail every couple of weeks. And, so, and she would, you know, back then you had to mail things with a stamp and everything. So she would put things in the mail and she would say, buy your books or get you food, whatever you need, but here's your money. And it wasn't enough to really help, but it was, that was not the point. My grandmother, with her fifth grade education, sent me that money from her fixed income that she earned as the lunch lady at Short Elementary School right here in Arlington. Her best friend was Beatrice Short. I grew up with that woman. I had no idea she was actually not my relative until I was in high school. So she was at all of our family reunions. Those two women together, my grandmother with no education, and Mrs. Short, who taught my dad, my aunts, and my uncles at Johnson Station School, was a part of my family upbringing. So combined with my mother, who was a strong supporter also of education, it's what lured me here. It's how I absolutely knew without doubt I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. I shared with Dr. Cavazos, I'm stepping out of an industry that I love. I mean, I've been comfortable where I've been. I know what I'm doing into a world where I know nothing. And so um, I'm excited to do that. I'm excited to do that with all of you and with all of my new colleagues. So I just want to say thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. And I will uh, just make a commitment to you that I will work very hard on behalf of education for all those other kids out there who need a voice in their life to say, go to school, get your education, here's a step up to help you get there. So um, I'll stop there. I just want to say thank you all, and I look forward to the journey ahead. So. Next, I'd like to introduce our new principal for Rankin Elementary, Ms. Lori Mosley. Lori, Lori attended Baylor University for a Bachelor of Arts in Communications, Baylor University for a Master of Science in Speech Pathology. Most recently, the interim principal at Rankin Elementary has been an academic dean at Johns Elementary, a speech pathologist at Dunn and Wood Elementary, a special education teacher at Dunn, a special education teacher at Key, and has also worked at Ashworth Elementary. Lori, congratulations. Thank you. Dr. Reich, Dr. Cavazos, members of the board, um, thank you so much uh, for your vote of confidence that I will um, support the staff, the students, and the community of Rankin. I am very proud to wear Rankin red. I've been at Rankin for the last six weeks, and it has been amazing. We've got great work to do, and I've got a great team that's ready to help me support and do that. I also have my John's family right behind them, coming from just two blocks east, so I didn't, I didn't go very far. Um, so they're both there to support me. I have my Ashworth family that they moved. Oh, y'all are up there now. <laughs> my Ashworth family. And then I have my own family here, my mom, my dad. Um, my mom was a 25-year teacher. Um, my dad is my rock. And then my husband, who was a Rankin rebel before they were Rankin Roadrunners. And so as I was driving and telling him, I, th I, th I think I'm the interim principal. He goes, hey, I was a ranking rebel. I went to elementary school there. I get to go to the principal's office. I was like, <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> and then my daughter, my biggest cheerleader. And so I am, I am so excited for this opportunity. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Wirtz um, and Tracy Brown, for thinking of me for the interim opportunity, and I will make you proud. Thank you. Next, I'd like to introduce the assistant principal for Crouch Elementary, Ms. Monique Tarver. 
Malik attended the University of Texas at Arlington for Bachelor of Arts in Marketing, Lamar University for Master of Ed in Ed Administration. Most recently, a data analyst campus test coordinator in Fort Worth ISD, has also been an elementary math coach, a third grade math teacher and science teacher, fourth grade math and science, fourth grade uh, and third grade teacher as well. Monique, congratulations and welcome. Thank you, President Reich, members of the board, and Dr. Cavazos. And thank you for your voting confidence in me being Crouch Elementary's new assistant principal. For the past 14 years, I've had the honor of working with some amazing leaders, and therefore leaving Fourth ISD is bittersweet. But I would like to think I'm bringing with me a little piece of each and every one of them who have aided in the development and preparation for me to embark on this new journey. And now to be joining Arlington ISD, where not only both my boys attend, but also my husband was a former student, I feel like I'm finally where I'm meant to be. My family could not be here tonight, but I would like to give them a shout out and thank them. Without their love and support, I would definitely not be standing here tonight. I would also like to give a huge thank you to Ms. Hollinger, Ms. Stevens, and her entire leadership team for believing in me and recognizing qualities they were looking for when selecting an assistant principal. I could not ask for a better leader to work with than Ms. Stevens. To quote John Welch, I mean Jack Welch, I'm sorry, before you are a leader, Success is all about growing yourself. When you become a leader, success is all about growing others. Again, I am honored for the opportunity to be one of Arlington ISD's newest leaders. Thank you. Last but not least, I'd like to introduce the assistant principal for Hale Elementary, Ms. Lorene Solis Koslowski. <laughs> Lorene attended the University of Texas at Arlington for Bachelor of Arts in History. University of Texas at Arlington for Master of Ed in Ed Leadership Policy Studies. Most recently, a fourth grade writing, language arts, social studies teacher in Mansfield ISD. Has been a fifth grade math teacher, a third grade bilingual teacher, and a first grade bilingual teacher in Irving ISD as well. Lorraine, congratulations and welcome. Thank you, uh, President Reich, members of the board, Dr. Cavazos. Thank you for this opportunity to um, join your team in Arlington and bring the skills and talents that I've learned along the way from Irving and Mansfield and that I can share with your students. Um, education is so important to me because it has molded who I am. Um, I have my mother who is not here tonight because she's passed away a couple years ago, but um, she always believed in education. And she had a third grade education and she said, you need to do your best. And so um, I honor that memory of her, and school was everything to me. It was the opportunity to do things that I would never have imagined. My first Broadway play, academic decathlon, all these wonderful things, and speech. I never thought my public, public speaking would be you know, something I would use, but I use it every single day. Um, my speech teacher was very, um, one of the most pivotal moments in my life was when she said, do great things. And that's what I wanted to do. I set out to do great things. Um, and to do that, um, I have the help and support of my family. Um, my children are here supporting me. My father is here. Unfortunately, my husband's away at work, but you know he will be here to support me as well. And then I have this wonderful team at Hale that I am so excited to come join. I'm so nervous, but um, I just feel that my energy and excitement, um, I'm so ready to start this new journey, and I can't wait to do great things at Hale Elementary. Thank you so much. Well, congratulations. Uh, to each and every one of you. Uh, thank you for uh, being a part of our district, those that are new to the district. Uh, uh, one of the, the underlying tones that I heard this evening were the, the roots in, of many to this district. Uh, that's, that's very significant, that, that says a lot uh, with the, the generational greatness that goes on in, in Arlington ISD. Uh, the other thing that I heard was uh, the honoring of education from family. And that is so significant and really appreciate hearing that from you as you <laughs> will essentially be family to all of those students and, and in our district for years to come and helping them uh, achieve the education and opportunity so that one day they can continue on in that cycle and that circle. So um, what I'd like to ask, uh, as is our custom, if you wouldn't mind please following Mr. Kale out to the lobby for a, a uh, reception to allow each of us to uh, greet you, welcome you, congratulate you. And I would ask uh, the audience, please indulge the board, allow us to go first so that we can come back in and, and continue on with business. So it's uh, 7.36 right now. We will uh, resume at uh, 7.50 p.m. Take a brief recess, thank you.
now call this meeting uh, back to order. And the uh, next item on our agenda is the open forum for agenda items. We have uh, one card, one individual to speak, uh, Mr. Stephen Poole, on the calendar update. Uh, this is a routine part of the school board's agenda for regularly scheduled meetings. The, this segment of the meeting provides citizens with an opportunity to share their views with the trustees on items that are on the agenda uh, tonight. It's not intended to be discussion or debate, and trustees will not reply to the speakers. I know you know this, Mr. Poole. Uh, derogatory comments aimed at an individual will not be tolerated, and personnel matters are not appropriate subjects of uh, open forum. So you will have five minutes to speak. A lighted timer on the podium will assist in pacing your presentation. A yellow light will illuminate when there's one minute left. And a red light uh, and buzzer will sound at the end. Please end your presentation at that time, Mr. Poole. Thank you, uh, Dr. Reich, uh, members of the board, and Dr. Cavazos. I'm Stephen Poole with UEA. And I know tonight on the agenda is a discussion item only for the uh, uh, calendar and how we move forward in the calendar process. Um, I hope you find a perfect calendar. Because if you do, you've kind of solved uh, solved the puzzle. Uh, because there is no perfect calendar. You're you're never going to please everyone uh, when you're developing calendars. Um, but it's important when we take a look at calendars. I used to play a game as a child called pick 'em up sticks. You know, the the object was to move a stick without moving the others. Uh, that's kind of the same way with the calendar. Moving one stick could affect all of the other uh, sticks that are involved. And it's not just calendars. So I know we've always talked about adding more time, adding more time so the students can get out and teachers can have more time without students to plan and prepare. That sounds good in theory, but the practical implica implications are important. You know, right now, our elementary teachers are struggling with all of the time pressures that they have. There's not enough time in the day to be able to accomplish it. We know teachers take work home at the end of the day. They just do. But I'm going to just show you one example of how a decision made at the state level translated down to the local level has an effect on teachers. The state evaluation system changed to the T-test model a couple of years ago. And Arlington decided to evaluate every teacher every year. But part of that evaluation is a goal setting conference, a conference now with the appraisers to set a student learning objective, a pre uh, appraisal conference, a post-appraisal conference, a mid-year checkup on the goals, and an end-of-year conference. Six separate meetings for one teacher evaluation. And you can almost guess when those meetings occur, during their planning time. And so the little bites at the apple of time throughout the day forces to teachers to take that work that they could accomplish in the day and take it home at night. So in calendar adding, adding minutes, so students get out early and we can structure time for teachers may be helpful, but it doesn't solve the day-to-day -day problems and the T-test is just one example of how time is eaten away from teachers. So I wish you the best of luck and we'll obviously work with you and provide input on the calendar uh, and uh, poll our members and see exactly what they think of the calendar options too. But uh, the calendar and the time, especially for the elementary, the, the secondary teachers get two planning times a, a, a day. Elementary teachers don't have that luxury. So the elementary time and the calendar is not mutually exclusive. Sometimes they go hand in hand, but we also need to work on both of those issues. Thank you. Very good, thank you, Mr. Poole. We're going to make a, a change on the agenda, on the schedule. Uh, typically, we uh, have the open forum for non-agenda items at the back end of our meeting. Uh, we do have two cards this evening, and, and we do have uh, some students in the audience that are, are part of the, this uh, group that, that wishes to speak on the non-agenda item. And we have a packed agenda, which may go very late. And so to, to honor them in, in getting home and, and taking care of uh, uh, business at home, uh, we will go forward with the uh, non-agenda open forum right now. Uh, I won't read all the rules that I, I just read. It's essentially the same thing that uh, uh, you know, no personnel issues, no derogatory comments. You'll be given five minutes to speak. And uh, uh, just to reiterate on that, uh, when you're down to one minute, uh, the yellow light will illuminate uh, to indicate that. At uh, 
Uh, the very end of your five minute time, the red light will come on, the buzzer will sound, and uh, uh, please end your uh, remarks at that time. We, we will not comment uh, back, but we definitely will hear what you have to say this evening. So there are two cards, as I stated. Uh, the first is from Mr. Craig Vogel, and the subject is re, uh, related to the improvement of the gymnastics facility and concerns. Mr. Vogel. Thank you, school superintendent. Uh, I mean, Dr. Cavazos and uh, school board, I'm happy to be talking to you here tonight. I was hired by the school district in 1987 and honored to teach in this district for 28 years before I retired in 2015. For the last 25 years of that time, I was the girls' gymnastics coach for the district, and it is for that reason I've come to talk to you this evening. I am here to give you some background and history of the gymnastics program in a hope that the district can find a way to better serve those students who dedicate themselves to this amazing sport. In 1990, I was one of two men who helped begin the gymnastics program here. For the first two years, we held practice in a rented gymnastics facility. Then in 1992, the old Nichols Junior High was closed and converted to the current Webb Elementary. At that time, the large main gymnasium was converted into a gymnastics facility. At that time, we were thrilled to have a district facility to call our own. Before I go on, I would like to tell you a little bit about our gymnastics program. Were you aware that the most successful sports program in the last 28 years in Arlington ISD is our gymnastics program? In the 25 years that I coached the girls' gymnastics team, we had a girls' team qualify to state 20 times finishing in the top 10 every year. I believe no other program can make such a claim. Our boys have also sent teams to state several times and between the boys and girls, we have sent more individual qualifiers to state than I can count. We have had over 100 All-American athletes, many national team members, and multiple state champions, including a boy from Bowie that won just three years ago. However, I want you to be aware of something else. In my opinion, much of that success has been achieved not because of the support that AISD has provided, but in spite of the obstacles that they have had to overcome from the district in achieving that. Let me explain to you what I mean by that statement. When we first moved into the old Nichols gym, it was already decades old and was designed primarily as a basketball gym. By 1995, two other districts with similar programs of all schools meeting in one facility, which were Irving and Richardson, had built dedicated gymnastics facilities. These facilities included in-ground pits filled with foam for safer and easier training of new skills, along with multiple apparatuses placed over them. Richardson Berkner would win the state championship in 1996. Meanwhile, back at Webb Elementary, Webb Elementary, excuse me, I pitched multiple ideas of improving or adding on to the existing building that would give us an in-ground pit and room for more equipment. But every time the requests were shot down and ignored. Then Rockwall and Boswell High Schools built dedicated facilities on their campuses and saw their participation numbers skyrocket. Since then, Rockwall has won six state championships, and as Saginaw, Chisholm Trail, and Rockwall Heath were built, they included a gymnastic facility, and all these schools have seen huge numbers of gymnasts every year. Recently, Saginaw Boys Team has won three state championships. Meanwhile, back at Webb Gymnasium. Hopefully you see now what I mean when I say our athletes had to overcome so much to reach the remarkable achievements that they have. For nearly 30 years, our gymnasts have been in what is now a 50-year-old basketball gym, lacking much of what they need to be successful. They compete on 20-year-old mats in 10-year-old leotards, and then they go to their locker rooms and change into clothes from 40-year-old bent and rusted lockers. Our numbers stay small because we are off campus, which makes recruiting very difficult. Yet in the face of all of this, they have not competed but excelled against athletes which have much better facilities and equipment. But I can't help but ask myself, how much more could they accomplish? How many more kids could, they, could we have in the program if only they were given the same opportunities and facilities that so many of the other districts have been willing to provide their students? That is why I'm here tonight, to ask you one more time to correct an injustice that has gone on for far too long to recognize the effort and talent and the dedication of a group of athletes and coaches by providing them with an equal playing field against other districts in the area. The year I retired, I attended planning sessions to help design the new facility that was approved in the bond package by voters, which was for a gymnastics, wrestling, and swimming facility. But sadly, that has seemed to disappear into thin air, like so many of the other promises in the past. 
I still hold the dream of someday seeing a gym on each campus. And like with all the other districts that have done so, have a chance to see our participation numbers skyrocket as well. But until then, we continue to wait. Meanwhile, back at the Webb Gymnastics Facility, boys and girls continue to work hard, improve and succeed, and hold on to the dream that one day they will not have to achieve in spite of their district, but instead be able to achieve with the help of their district. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vogel. Appreciate those words. Next, we have Stephanie Middleton, uh, subject also uh, for the Gymnastics Growth and Future of Gymnastics program with current concerns. <coughs> Thank you, Board, Dr. Cavazos, um, President. Thank you for allowing me to speak. I was a Martin Gymnastics gymnast from 1995 to 97 in the current web gymnastics facility. Um, very successful. And now I'm a parent of a freshman Martin gymnast, boy gymnast. It pains me um, when he comes home and says, we, we have our facility that doesn't have a floor because they were doing construction to web and they ruined our equipment. We don't have the uniforms that we all need. I don't have grips. These things should be provided to these students for gymnastics just like they are for every other athletic um, group at any of the high, high schools. I'm sorry. Emails and phone messages have been gone left um, unresponse since summer about these concerns, about things that need to be done. And before then, many years, like my former coach has brought you ahead. Um, um, I, an email was sent out that I sent out and the response I got was there are, no, there, you don't have the numbers to be able to be placed into a facility like the athletics complex. But how are we going to get the numbers if you're trying to bring students to do a gym, gymnastics at a facility that's 60 years old, that has mildewy mats and smells like mildew. Oh, it does, it's horrible. I wanna put a positive spin on this. Gymnastics is a beautiful sport. It's the most watched sport in the Olympics. Everyone loves to watch gymnastics. It is a very difficult sport and safety is a very big concern with that. Um, with the new facility, we, we, we need a new facility. Putting a Band-Aid on a leaky roof or a leaky door so that we don't have mildewy mats at the end of our vault is not going to help improve and help us get the numbers that we need for gymnastics. This year, Martin has been awarded the um, we are hosting the regional gymnastics meet at Martin. It will be at Martin High School, not at Webb, which is a good thing because Webb would not be able to support a gymnastics event of that magnitude. Um, this will bring much um, advertisement to our to gymnastics because half the people on Martin, the kids, I have two kids at Martin, half the kids don't even know we have gymnastics because there is not a campus, um, there's nothing on campus that t says that there's gymnastics. There's no trophy case, there's no sign, there's nothing like, I mean, just like with the rest of the sports that we have. And it's a shame, and I'm very passionate because I did gymnastics for 18 years, and now I have a son that is doing it as well. In order to get these numbers up, we have to have a representation on each campus, at least one campus. Um, we need to incorporate junior high gymnastics to get these kids to know that there is, you start in junior high and then you can continue on to high school. Not, here's a taste of what gymnastics is when you're in second grade, now come join the high school gymnastics team when you come to high school. It's a progressive sport that these kids get health, wellness, it, is, it encompasses everything that a child needs 
self-esteem building, um, working out every day, two hours a day, every day, conditioning, okay? It's not just go and, and do something for an hour and then you leave. Go hit a, hit a ball with a racket. You're doing something al al athletic every day, and it helps. It helps you be um, a part of a school team that you represent your school. I am a Martin gymnast. I can get a letter jacket for that, where I don't have to try out and get cut because we have too many kids or I'm not good enough. This is someplace that these kids can go fit in with other kids just like them, whether they can do a cartwheel or a double back, and they all get the same benefit from this wonderful, wonderful sport. And thank you. Thank you very much. All right. We will uh, continue on with our agenda. Uh, the next item, uh, next section is action items. Uh, the first item is the uh, consider the extension of the superintendent term contract. Ms. Walton. Uh, Dr. Reich, uh, I would like to make a motion at this time. Would that be appropriate? Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, I move to approve the superintendent's contract as presented and award him a monetary performance incentive as discussed in closed meeting and consistent with paragraph 5.3 of his contract. Thank you. There's a motion. Second. And a motion by Ms. Walton, a second by Mr. Hibbs uh, for the extension of the superintendent term contract. Is there any discussion? All right. Seeing none, please vote. Are you nervous, Dr. Cavazos? <laughs> uh, motion carries unanimously. Dr. Cavazos, uh, uh, thank you uh, for your service to this district, to this board. Uh, we, uh, as a board, uh, in extending this uh, contract, uh, show our, uh, and literally the vote of confidence that we have in you in continuing to lead this uh, district on the upward trajectory uh, that has been occurring uh, since your uh, leadership at the helm. Uh, thank you. We look forward to uh, continuing on this journey with you as a, t a true team of eight. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Next, uh, we have action item B. Consider the superintendent's recommendation to propose termination and non-renewal of the term contract of Gregory Peters. Mr. Hibbs. Mr. President, I move to accept the superintendent's recommendation uh, to propose termination and non-renewal re non of the term contracts of the following professional employee, Gregory Peters. And I move that the record of this action reflect the following. Before voting on this motion, the board considered a draft letter to Dre Gregory Peters providing notice of proposed termination and non-renewal. The superintendent reviewed with the board the reason or reasons for making this recommendation regarding the employee and that the board consider the reason and reasons of any information provided by the superintendent and that by the passage of this motion, the board directs the superintendent to prepare for the, pres uh, the board president's signature a final uh, notice of proposed termination and non-renewal for uh, Gregory Peters and to ensure the notice is delivered to each employee no later than December 1st, 2018. It, it directs uh, that the notice of proposed termination and non-renewal include the time limitations and procedure for requesting a hearing before an independent hearing examiner. Agrees if a hearing is uh, timely requested to engage an attorney to assist the board in the conduct of the hearing on the proposed non-renewal, including any pre-hearing matters necessary to ensure a fair, efficient, and ex expeditious hearing. It directs the board president to notify Echelbaum, Wardell, Hanson, Powell, and Mel, PC, of this action and requests that the office uh, to retain an attorney on behalf of the board. 
if necessary, to advise the board concerning legal matters upon receipt of a recommendation from the independent hearing examiner and authorizes Echelbaum, Wardell, Hansen, Powell, and Mel to consult with the superintendent to approve the final notice or propose contract termination and non-renewal and to take whatever actions are necessary and proper to present the case in support of the proposed termination and non-renewal and directs that the copy of this motion be attached to the minutes of this meeting and that the final notice of proposed termination and non-renewal be sent to Gregory Peters. Thank you, Mr. Hibbs. That was read as a motion. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Motion by Mr. Hibbs, second by Mr. Hogg. Is there any discussion? Uh, okay, seeing none, uh, please vote. Motion carries unanimously. All right. Next, we will uh, move to our discussion action portion of the agenda. Uh, the first item is the consideration of our 2019 legislative agenda. Uh, Dr. Kavassos. Thank you, President Rice. And this evening, we'd like uh, for board consideration to review the uh, legislative agenda. Our uh, board governance committee has worked uh, with staff uh, on the preparation of this agenda. And so I'll Turn it over to Mr. Hogg. Go right ahead, Mr. Hogg. Thank you, Dr. Prasos, and thank you, Dr. Reich. Um, as the chair of the governance committee with my colleagues, Ms. Walton and uh, Mr. Chapa, we bring back to you, and I know this year it feels like we've brought a lot of legislative agendas, because we have. Um, you know, in our first years on these boards, we didn't even have a legislative agenda. This is crazy to think 10 years ago there wasn't one. Um, I think the first one we created, Dr. Reich and I honestly borrowed it from another district um, around there and took some, uh, some writers, um, writers' freedom to change it up and make it our own. Um, and, and now you see where we've come, where we just passed um, and worked with a an interim legislative agenda and what we're tackling to now our official session legislative agenda. Um, this is a critical factor for this board because it does give us, as a group, as a unit of seven, what we as a district are fighting for and working for. Um, I always warn people on these legislative agendas, especially teachers and staff, legislative agendas do not cover everything. We can't get everything on there. And I think we all know, um, when people ask me what's the hard part about being a school board member, it's making hard votes sometimes, but it's what Austin does that makes it so hard on the work we try to do and try to perform. And I think it's the biggest learning curve most school board members have. Um, I'm looking at Ms. Fowler, one of our newest colleagues, and it's hard. It's hard to understand what Austin dictates as a, as a board member, because we're all in this, the fight for kids, but so many of the rules and things that come down from Austin determine what we have and what we can do um, with that. So with, with that, I, I commend this board for taking a very active role in the legislative process. Um, it's something we have to fight hard constantly throughout the year, but especially hard um, <laughs> for 140 days every other odd year. Because uh, one little bill, and luckily our legislature's made to not pass bills, the system's designed, but unfortunately they do pass bills sometimes. Sometimes they're good, HB5 was a good thing for us, um, there's some other ones I can talk about in the past that if they got passed, we would all be in lots of trouble. And we know some of those fights we'll have coming up again. Just to kind of give some <laughs> overview of this uh, entire legislative agenda, um, it's facing on a couple of things. We're working on local control, relevant instruction, and funding mandates. Um, I can say, as we always include at the back, um, our list of unfunded mandates. It's at $80 million right now, and not all these mandates are always bad things. Um, but they are all unfunded. Um, some of these are good things they put in place, but it sure would have been nice if when they put something in place, they actually fund it and do that from that. It's actually down a little bit. I think it was $84 million in our last legislative session. 
Um, so, I, but I don't think we can take credit for that four million because I don't know where it came from. Um, like a lot of things. <clears throat> so with that, we're covering some major subjects of academic accountability, school safety and mental health, school finance, school choice, and pre-K is what we're tackling on there. Just a couple of highlights um, to hit. We're, we're pushing on academic accountability of a local authority address low performing schools with locally elected board making decisions, fighting the A through F rating system and making sure it defines a performance uh, remove the high stakes SSI retention provision for grades five through eight. Um, and the key word there is high stakes on there. Um, make the individual graduation committees permanent. This is something that's worked really well in all the districts around. And, and as all legislators thought, boards were going to start abusing. And that's not been the case, um, like most things that boards do. Um, expand the list of industry based certifications needed. Um, school finance and mental health. Um, as you know, this is a major topic and will be coming up. Um, we're encouraging to really focus on um, as safety is also a mental health piece to give boards um, control to how we want to address uh, some of these items with appropriate funding for threat, assess threat assessments and determine what should be done on these on the platform to help on these. In school finance, touch on a couple of things there of student achievement, um, improve equity, reduce the dependence on local property tax with long-term solutions. Listen, we know school finance is gonna get talked about. Um, could something happen? I think every legislative session now, this will be my fifth one, I go into it going, something's gonna happen. Um, and we don't really know what's gonna happen uh, on that. We would ask them to reduce the reliance on recapture uh, for public education and fund at least 50% of the total cost of education. Um, an increase in the basic allotment for all school districts, adjust funding for regional variations, roll the current allotments for gifted and talented high school and new instructional into the basic allotment, which gives <laughs> local boards uh, more flexibility in addressing local needs, um, pro provide top property tax relief to owners um, to provide relevant learning, fully funding the $40 guarantee, which they have not done on that. Um, Going into just a little bit, the qualified education workforce, and you all know this is an item I talk about many a times, but passing legislation that authorizes Arlington ISD to exit TRS Active Care um, because we are not able to provide a quality um, health care plan for our employees. Um, but not only TRS Active Care, which is just for our actives, we also have in there to work for our retirees who, you know, in all essence, they're not part of AISD. They're not on our books, but they've been part of our family for a long time. So we're still fighting for them to ensure the teacher retirement system has actually or is actuarially sound funding and that it stays as a defined benefit plan. We have a lot of teachers that we recruit that come into teaching because it is a DB plan and not a DC plan, which is a key factor. And it is a recruitment tool. Um, the young lady speaking before, um, it, it, it's a factor. It's a lot of people get into this profession for that exact reason um, to provide that. And then getting into some of the local authority, um, reject legislation requires expanded ballot language, mandates November elections, requires super majority, uh, grants school district flexibility, invest surplus oil and gas royalties, provide relief from unfunded current mandates um, to affect that. And then school choice. Um, as we know, Arlington's been a school choice district for a long time, um, but we have to fight this every time because they only have to win it once. And then we have issues that other states are facing currently, but reject any legislation diverts fun public funds to private, no matter what they want to call it, vouchers, tax credits, um, whatever new creative name they came up with on the next time. Um, incentivize school districts um, to provide choice on fully funding transportation. I always make the comment of, why do private schools are the only ones that get the word choice? Why can't public schools offer more choice? And I commend our district for fully um, making sure choice is a relevant issue because you have to provide transportation to make choice a real option for that. And as we know, the funding for transportation has not gone up since 1984, and there are no incentives to offer more choice programs for public education um, with that. Require more transparency and accountability for charters. Um, and you'll see some of the bullets we have listed on there of items that the charters do not have to follow um, that public schools do on this. And then the last piece, we have, and, and I, I, I probably should say it shouldn't be the last one, but it's okay, because um, it's on there and people remember the first and the last, so maybe that's a good thing. We'll sell it to them that way. Um, but yay for pre-K. Um, this district invests a lot of money in pre-K. 
Um, most people don't know, we don't get funded for full day pre-K. But this board and this senior staff knows the value of pre-K and knows what it does. Um, as, a, as a guy with a four-year-old right now, um, I know how important pre-K is. I know what it is, and I can't imagine how many kids we have coming into our schools that don't know their colors, that don't know their numbers, and they're already behind starting in kindergarten. So I commend this board for that, but we still have to continue to fight because um, the state still hasn't bought in to the value of pre-K. Um, they use it as a political fodder sometimes, but don't really get a full vested interest on what it's doing um, to have that fight. Um, overall, I think we've got a very robust, robust thank you, Ms. Walton, a great word right there, um, agenda. As we said, it doesn't cover everything. Um, hopefully it covers the main points and allows us to talk through this. As we know, um, any items that come up in session, we usually send um, when I ask this board to follow through with, to, to allow us to do that again, where our committee is able to send notes out, or as the committee chair, or as board president, or as a committee to represent the board on a last minute item um, based on this agenda is how we usually come in and work on this. Because unfortunately, in 140 days, Things go really slow, and then they start going really, really fast. And, and time is of the essence, and you can't wait for every two weeks for a board to have meetings. So uh, we all start blocking our calendars for those odd years um, to, to start working through and fight through that. So with that board, I'd ask that one thing. One thing Ms. Walton did bring up to me earlier, and Ms. Powell, this is one item we, uh, we think we need on there. We talked about adding under academic accountability of adding a place for data collection for there, of collecting data. Because um, as we've seen through A through F and some of those as we get tracked, we're not able to collect the data from the universities or career military readiness. Um, so I, I would ask that um, if this board allows, we put one item in there to reiterate our purpose of the board and the district to be able to have the state actually provide us that data from our Tarrant County College from our junior colleges so that we can actually track students because right now we're having to just track on our own and figure out how where they're going whereas a state mandated system could be in place to help us track if a student is enrolling in the military instead of us just asking if they're enrolled in the military because we believe we do a good job but we also don't know how many we're missing that are enrolling in college that are enrolling in the military because they made that option after they graduate from high school and we didn't catch them before. Um, so that is the one piece we'd like to add under academic accountability. Um, and Ms. Walton, thank you for catching that um, under there. Yeah, under number two, I think, is where Ms. Walton had exactly pointed. With that, that is a summary of our legislative agenda um, that I uh, ask this board to consider. And are you saying that in then a form of a motion to approve? Yeah, no, it's, it's discussion, discussion actions. We can take all action tonight. Um, yes, Dr. To. Reich, at this time, I would, uh, as we've talked about this a couple of weeks in the past and made adjustments, um, I would uh, move to approve the legislative agenda as proposed with uh, changes as noted. All right, Ms. Walton. I will second that motion. All right, so we have a, a motion by Mr. Hogg and a second by Ms. Walton to approve this legislative agenda uh, with the addition of the data collection system uh, in included under point two, under <coughs> academic account accountability. Is there any discussion from anybody? I just have a, a, a question, uh, Mr. Hogg, over, over the years, this agenda, uh, the, the design of it, I think, is, has been more articulate uh, in development and progression. Uh, it's it's uh, more of an intelligent approach, informed approach. Uh, by and large, the, the majority of the items haven't really changed much on this agenda. We've been resolute in our positions. Um, so uh, maybe this is more philosophical, but uh, my question to you is, do you feel that it has had positive outcome, has had good results? is moving the needle towards what we're trying to do for our students. You know, Dr. Reich, the legislative agenda is only as beneficial as the people that are actually utilizing it. Um, and I think we can give any piece of paper, and we always say, we always come up with them from this, a one-page sheet, because legislators can't read very long. 
I mean, most board members can't either. So uh, we have to keep it pretty short and simple. Um, now, I will say their staff, when you meet with any legislative staff, um, I think we break it out in a really effective way. Um, we receive really positive feedback from them. Um, it makes it very easy for them to look up where we stand on certain items. Um, I think as the years have gone on, with help of Ms. Powell and our, our staff and our entire team, um, we've become much more defined um, and targeting. I think when we started tackling this, we were trying to go too big. And you start seeing, we haven't really changed our objectives and our, our main subjects in there, but we've definitely become more targeted on individual items within um, this agenda. And, and I think that's a critical factor to make it very clear what needs to change and what needs to happen. If you talk about our success, I think we had a huge effort in HB5 getting that passed years ago. And I think our legislative agenda and our work from our um, superintendent and board staff and, and team to get that passed was a critical factor um, for some of those. I think all of our legislators really appreciate the unfunded mandates list um, to help them understand that. Not, not so much for them to change, but to help prevent more unfunded mandates from coming in. I say, um, in legislative work, it's as good, you know, like I'm an old football player, um, a good defense is probably even better than a strong offense in that world. And I'm an offensive football player, so I, it's hard for me to say on that side, Ms. Mays and her sons know offensive line or we love, we love what we do with each other. But uh, it, it's, this is a defensive document also. This is a document to let them know what we're protecting ourselves against um, on there. And then we've got some items in there where we're going on the offense. Um, to also protect us and, and try and get get some positive sides of this to be able to be fixed. So Thank long you. answer, I think it's a good document, Dr. Reich. Could cool. have just said that. That'd be boring. No, no, I, I appreciate the elaboration. I absolutely do. I and I I ask that essentially knowing the answer, which I, I know you're not supposed to ask a question that you already know the answer to, but I think it's important for this board to 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 understand that the needle has moved because of this document year in and year out. And it's not something that we go through time and effort to present year in and year out. And it just gets ignored one more time. That, uh, it, and as you said, it's not just the document, it's the, the action and the advocacy that goes along with it. So uh, I appreciate you articulating that. Did you, you no? Know? Okay. All right, so I uh, look forward to what will be an active session coming up and, and the uh, uh, supportive documents to this agenda, shortened versions, uh, educational materials so that we can educate our, our district uh, internally and externally uh, as we move forward in making... And Dr. Rush, we met with all the all our local legislation delegation during the interim and we will, uh, you know, we got to let them get through this session, but then right when they start getting staffs and whoever's in office, we will then as a, a committee and a board start meeting with their staffs um, as the, you know, post Tuesday, they start hiring and start yep. determining who is going to be running their Austin offices um, and some of those. So it will start picking up quickly. Um, Got to get through people these three elections and then yep. time, time will start flying fast. Sure, absolutely. All right, seeing no lights uh, indicating further discussion, uh, we're, we do have the motion on the table to approve this legislative agenda with the uh, 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 edits or changes, or the additions. Um, so uh, when it comes up, please vote. All trustees present, vote in the affirmative. Uh, Mr. Hibbs had to leave to catch a flight. All right, uh, thank you, Mr. Hogg. Uh, thank you uh, to the governance committee as a whole. It's a, a tremendous amount of work. Thank you, Ms. Powell. Thank you to our consultants. Um, there's a lot of moving parts uh, to this. I really appreciate the, the time and effort and the energy. And uh, thanks in advance for more that's yet to come. So moving forward, uh, we will move on to the consent agenda. Are there any items uh, that uh, trustees wish to be withdrawn from the consent agenda? All right. Uh, seeing none, then we will move on to the uh, full consent and uh, uh, we'll consider the items that are on, on the agenda under consent. Uh, Ms. Powell, would you please share bids? 
Special Rice Board members, Dr. Cavazos, good evening. Uh, we have no bids on this particular agenda. We do have donations. Uh, the donations presented for your consideration this evening total $64,676, and that brings our year-to-date total to $361,451. Very good. Very good. Very impressive. All right. Thank you, Ms. Powell. Is there a motion to approve consent? Ms. Mays? Uh, I make a motion that we approve the consent agenda as read. And a second. Uh, second by Ms. Uh, Mrs. Fowler. Uh, so the motion by Mrs. Mays, second by Mrs. Fowler uh, to approve consent. Any discussion? Uh, please vote. All trustees present vote in the affirmative. Consent passes. Uh, moving on to our uh, discussion items this evening. Uh, the first item is the uh, Gibson reports on the student and parent uh, spring survey results. Uh, welcome, Dr. Cavazos. Thank you, President Rice. And um, this time I'd like to call Dr. Barlow up and uh, to do an introduction. Um, and so uh, this is a continuation. As you know, we did our employee engagement survey a couple of board meetings ago and discussed that with the board. And all the tools and the reframing and the, uh, the levers, trying to identify those levers to actually make a, an impact. Well, we've done the same thing uh, thanks to the work of Kevin Barlow and Gibson Consulting and others uh, to do that with student surveys and the parent engagement surveys. And uh, so you're going to see some of the very similar constructs to try to determine exactly what are those levers to, uh, to actually change. And so uh, Dr. Barlow, first, before anything else, thank you for your leadership in this, in this effort as with the employee engagement surveys as well. So, turn it over to you. Absolutely, well good evening, President Rice, members of the board, and Dr. Cavazos. Thank you for having a few minutes uh, this evening to continue our discussion on our survey results from last spring. And as Dr. Cavazos indicated, uh, this is kind of a continuation. We uh, kind of covered part one, uh, I think about four weeks ago, uh, on the employee engagement survey. Uh, tonight we'll discuss the parent uh, satisfaction survey and the student uh, satisfaction survey. And I think it's important to at least address that first component about four weeks ago because uh, as indicated, the construct or the model is very similar. And uh, using this uh, kind of new technique uh, to Arlington anyway, uh, with respect to the way we've done surveys, I think it gives us a little bit richer, uh, more meaningful information with respect to what levers we can actually push to actually make a difference with respect to uh, the satisfaction our parents and uh, students have uh, within the district. So, um, so again, Gibson Consulting is uh, with us tonight. I uh, want to introduce uh, Dr. Amy Rappaport, uh, Elizabeth Marwa, and uh, Daniel Hefner, uh, the team from Gibson. And so they're going to come up and present uh, the results. I was really excited when they presented the uh, initial findings to me with respect to what they found in the models. So I think you're going to be uh, very uh, interested in, uh, in the results that they have. So uh, Amy? I realize you all have a very packed agenda and that very exciting calendar discussion coming up. So we will try to be nice and quick. Um, I'm glad we had the chance to kind of take a pause and come back to present the rest of the results because we spent a lot of time last time we were here giving you, um, helping you to see the way we designed this method and, and the thought we put into how we structured the surveys and how we structured the analysis. Today I'm going to just kind of dive right in to the results um, because I, I want to allow more time for discussing the results and talking about them. Um, I'm going to start with where we ended last time, which is those employee engagement results. Um, this was the model we talked about how we measure the thing we care about as an outcome as only one component of what we're measuring. And in the employee engagement survey, it was satisfaction. But we also measure all these other components and elements that we think and that we know and that we think are related to satisfaction so we can look at the relationship between all these variables. And when we were here, we ended up talking about how supervisor support and perceptions of safety were critical drivers of employee satisfaction, um, as well as engagement and burnout. And so today, we're going to talk about the parent survey. We're going to talk about the student survey. Can you see the slides? Yeah, OK. OK. Um, I mentioned this last time. I'm going to mention it again. Sometimes we can get caught up with semantics. And I, and I say that because a lot of, sometimes I'm just applying a label here. I, I, we all 
jointly came up with labels. What are we calling satisfaction? What are we calling perceptions of safety? So in your handouts, you should have these, these um, handouts, one for the parent, one for the survey. And the, the items that are in the survey are listed here. So you can see what we mean when we talk about each of these, um, these levers or cons constructs. And so on this slide, I'm just going to go over a couple of examples. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. But just to give you a flavor for what we're talking about when we're measuring satisfaction for parents, we're measuring responses to questions, how satisfied are you with the school? How satisfied, sa how satisfied are you with the teachers? How satisfied are you with the academic standards of the school? So we take the average of the responses to all of that. So when we're talking about satisfaction, it really has that multidimensional component to it. With parents, if you remember in that employee model, in the middle of the model were the things that we kind of are taking the pulse of, but the left-hand side of the model are those levers that we think we can really change. So in the parent model in the middle, we have perception, parents' perceptions of the rigor of the school, and again, I'll point you to the items we use to measure that. The school is preparing my student well for college. The school is preparing students well for jobs. My child is working hard. There's more than that, but I'm just giving you a flavor here. and then. We wanted to capture something that we know influences parents and, and student outcomes, but that's always hard to sort of measure, and that's the parents' own expectations for their own child, for their child's career in college. So we, we have that in the model, too, because we want to kind of control for all these variations when we're looking at the model. The levers, the ones we want to look at, which of these things are most strongly related to satisfaction and driving satisfaction, we have perceptions of leadership, we have communication, the extent to which the schools are communicating with parents. Um, program opportunities, do the schools have adequate opportunities for the children to be participating in the arts or in language and culture or um, providing information about programs and services? We have questions about respectful environment. So is my family treated with respect? Are my children treated with respect by their teachers? And are the staff trying to get to know my family? The safety construct for the parent survey, like with the employee survey, was multidimensional. It wasn't just physical safety. It also had to do with um, um, bullying, cyberbullying, online bullying, um, and physical bullying. And then opportunities for parent engagement. This was the extent to which parents perceived that the schools are giving them opportunities to be involved. And this is what this looks like when it's drawn out in the same model as the, as the parent engagement. A little bit about our data collection so you can understand who we're talking about when, or the, the rigor of the data when we talk about the results. We had almost 13,000 completed surveys, which is a lot of surveys. Um, this was up from 8,700 last year, so we got significantly more this year. The relationship between students and the parents on file for them is very complex. A student can be related to multiple parents. A parent can be related to multiple students. Sometimes a student and a, two students who are siblings don't have the same parents listed for them. So it's very, the, the, they're very complex relationships in the data. So it's really hard to just say what was the response rate because parents got a survey for every child that they had. Um, we call it a unique parent-child link, <laughs> and there were lots of them. Um, so instead what we do is we look at the number of students and we try to say, what percentage of students had a survey completed for them? Because students can have one or two or three completed for them. Um, so we try to talk about coverage. And generally, we had about 20% of the kids in the district had at least one parent complete a survey for them, which is really quite phenomenal. It might sound low, but when you're dealing with such large universes of populations and you can't necessarily directly touch each person, um, 20% is pretty good. The more important part of this is just because of the nature of sampling and the huge volume of responses, the margin of error we have here is less than 1%. You're hearing a lot about margin of error with polling right now. Um, the, the anybody, any poll, pollster would be thrilled with a margin of error this small. So we feel really good about the data that we have. <clears throat> and we're going to jump into the results. Last time I don't think I did a good enough job giving you guys some tangible um, what, is the, what is the distribution of the, uh, the actual results, just looking at them at a glance? And so I wanted to give you a little bit more of that today. And so this is our outcome for parent satisfaction. Before we talk about the model and the results of the model, I just want to show you how satisfied your parents are. This is a phenomenal distribution on this satisfaction score. Remember, it's a mean across those three items. And the scale runs from 1 to 4. So parents can have a mean anywhere from 1 to 4. And you can see 
on the left-hand graph that the majority of parents have scores of three or four on that mean. In fact, I think 85% of parents have a mean score of three or four on satisfaction. So we have a very highly satisfied population. The graph on the right shows you the average mean satisfaction score for parents of elementary students, for parents of middle school students, and parents of high school students. It tends to be highest at elementary. That's a common finding. Um, and it goes down a little bit as the grade levels go up. Now, just because we have a very skewed distribution doesn't mean we can't harness the, vari the variability. And there is variability. And so we harness that variability when we look at this model to look at, OK, we have variability in all of the constructs that are measured, the levers on the right-hand side and the outcomes. And so when we run the model to say, OK, which of these levers are the most strongly related to satisfaction? Remember, we're accounting for both the direct relationship on satisfaction and also all the indirect relationships in the model, the ones that we can draw arrows to. The number one strongest um, predictor or, or driver of satisfaction is the construct that is respectful environment. And I want to read to you the items for that. My family is treated with respect at the school. School staff make a point to get to know my family. And the teachers at my child's school respect the students. That is the number one strongest driver of satisfaction. The second, and it's a close second, is communication with parents. And the third strongest is that perceptions of rigor. What's very interesting is when you look at it by school level, it's similar but a little bit different. Uh, for elementary parents, communication is number one. Respectful environment is number two. And rigor is number three. When you look at middle school, that respectful environment construct is number one. Communication is number two. Rigor is number three. And when you look at the high school level, actually, Communication falls away. Respectful environment is very strong. Um, and program opportunities pops up. And rigor is still very strong. So it's a, it's a clear message. It's a little bit more succinct than with the employee results because there wasn't as much, as many components that were driving the outcome. I have more of those sort of tangible graphs that show you the level of the different constructs here. I don't want to take up too much of your time, but if you're interested in seeing them, this is the mean on respectful environment. You can see it also is mostly positive. There's a little bit more variation on it than the satisfaction scale. This is the communication with parents. You can see, again, it's all very positive, but there is variation. Um, perceptions of rigor, very high, and program opportunities. So you can look at those on your on your own. Um, again, we had open-ended questions for the parents. And I'm going to turn it over to Liz to talk a little bit about the qualitative results. And then I'm going to come back and I'm going to do that same review for the student data. Thank you, Amy. Great. Hello again. Um, so as Amy talked about, uh, you know, for this parent survey, we had two open-ended questions. One asked, describe one thing that you are extremely satisfied with at your child's school. And then kind of the inverse was focusing on areas for improvement, one thing you would change to increase your satisfaction with your child's school. And again, a phenomenal response rate with uh, over 7,500 parents responding to at least one of those two questions. So nearly 13,000 responses for us to look at and analyze. Um, it was great. <laughs> we used the same, a terrific problem to have. Yeah, I, uh, I think I've called myself a data hog before. I really, I, I like seeing all of the, the parents' voices and just like we did with the employee voices. And we used the same rigorous method where this was kind of a side-by-side -side process with the quantitative statistical modeling. We used a team of coders and analysts to categorize responses and compare different subgroups. With this particular survey, you know, we did it by campus level, of course. We didn't have some of those other subgroup analyses that we did for the employee. Uh, and then the triangulation is the really fun part where we look at the, the modeling and the qualitative together to see how the qualitative can illustrate and oftentimes support and help explain maybe a little bit more, uh, particularly in parents' own voices what this awesome, sophisticated modeling is showing us. And so here is another one of those fun word clouds that shows all of the topics that emerged 
from both of these questions. This is looking at the two questions combined since they are kind of two sides of the same coin and the topics that came from the two questions were largely the same. Lots of parents, you know, who were extremely satisfied uh, expressed being extremely satisfied with these big topics. And then some parents also said these big things were things that could improve their satisfaction. And this is what helps illustrate those high levels of satisfaction that Amy described and maybe maybe show some glimpses of maybe some of the whys and hows in the variation. For the most prevalent topics shared across campus levels, um, feedback on teachers and staff <laughs> is the most prevalent topic by far. Uh, over 40% um, of responses are captured this way across the two questions, what, what is extremely satisfied and then what could improve satisfaction. Uh, largely positive feedback though for this category for teachers and staff. Most of this data is from that first question saying that parents are extremely satisfied with their teachers and staff. And what's really interesting and notable is it's describing and illustrating another piece of that social environment you saw that respectful environment piece is such a big important construct and you heard the items that are associated with it. The, the language parents use give us a more full picture of that and, and some of the other things they're describing. They're talking about teachers and staff getting to know their students and support their students and love and care for them and help them. Um, and again, that's mostly from the first question, being extremely satisfied much less data came from the second question, although it was there. Uh, and then across the levels again, with elementary through high school, communication is the second most prevalent topic that emerged from the open-ended data. And this one, it was the most common thing that could improve satisfaction. It was number one for the second question of what, what things could help improve parent satisfaction, but it was number two for things that folks are extremely satisfied with. So this indicates that variation uh, and shows that there are pockets and that it is a lever. And um, it does really nicely clearly align with that quantitative modeling that shows us communication as a big, big lever. Uh, and uh, I think Amy will talk more. I think you've got the variation to show as well there. Trying to keep it to one page <laughs> for each. Okay. Uh, okay. Student results. So um, we're focusing our presentation today on the same consistent model that we're using across all three: um, parent, and employee, and student. What's important about that is there's only a subset of survey questions that are asked to students at every grade level, and so we're focusing today on just the questions that we asked of students at every grade level. In prior years, we've come and we've presented a lot of descriptive data. On, um, on the high school student survey results about going to college and, and what classes are they taking. And that part of what we ask <coughs> only 12th graders is not part of this model. This model, we're, we're presenting this lens on what are the levers of the outcome that we're interested in today. So what we're talking about for students um, is a component of satisfaction. It's a little bit different than with employees and parents where we started, we designed the survey from the beginning and we said satisfaction is our outcome. With students, we were largely using the same instrument that we've used over the past six years so that we have that consistency over time. And this question has been on the survey all those years and it's about how prepared do you feel for the next grade level or how prepared do you feel for what comes after high school if they're in 12th grade. And so we use that, we, we we uh, appreciate that it is not exactly the same thing as satisfaction, but it does work as that out that right hand column of our of our model of what we what we are looking at predicting. What we know in, is in the middle of the model is something that we can kind of take the temperature of is that kids have different levels of engagement in school, different levels of interest in in their own education, and so we we try to measure that, we try to tap that, we try to get a measure of it, but it's not what we're focusing on as a lever. Some of the questions there are: I enjoy learning. Uh, what I learn in class is useful for me. Outside of school, I feel like I do a good job um, in school. The levers, the things that we're going to put on the left hand side. We ask the students a set of questions about um, 
the instruction that they experience in their classroom, and we ask it four times. One time for their math classes, one time for their ELA classes, one time for science, and one time for social studies. All the items are, again, on your handout, but their examples are when work is difficult, my teacher helps me keep trying. I'm sorry, I skipped the first one. My teacher takes the time to review or summarize what we learned. Teacher stopped to check if students understood a concept. And we borrowed these from a national longitudinal survey. Um, and, and they're just typically good instruction methods. And so we have four different measures, one for each subject area. We also ask them questions about their school climate. And again, it has to do with respect. Teachers respect me. Students respect each other. Classmates disrespect each other. We reverse code them if they're in the wrong direction. We also have a construct in the student survey that we're calling social support. And again, it's just a label, so I encourage you to look at those items. But it's school staff listen to what I have to say. School staff believe that every student can be a success. I feel like an important part of my community. I feel like I fit in. So there's something social about that and something support about that. And then there's a, it's, it's like a safety construct here, but I'm not calling it safety because the valence is the opposite. So this is about bullying and fights. And so if the score is high, that means there are fights and they do feel bullied. So here we have higher is more bullying, less safe. So I'm not calling it safety. <laughs> but we do have that measure across all three survey populations. So it's interesting to make comparisons about where that pops up. This is what it looks like. It's a little different because you'll notice we only have one bubble in the middle of the figure. But it's the same method behind the modeling. For students, as you've heard us tell you every year, we get a phenomenal response rate. Your staff just do a f like an amazing job getting kids to do this survey. We have over 80% of kids in the district that complete the, the survey. It's over 13,000 kids. Um, it's a pretty stable response rate year to year. It's pretty stable across all the different grade levels. It goes down a little bit as the kids get older. And again, our margin of error is less than half a percent. <laughs> And the results were very interesting. Again, I wanted to give you an appreciation of the, the sort of big picture, the zoomed out perspective, how prepared our kids feeling. 91% of them answer a three or a four on the four point scale. So they're feeling very prepared for the next grade by the time they finish, by the time they do the survey, which is at the end of the school year. And again, it goes down a little bit in high school, but it's generally very high. Okay, so the results are very interesting. Social support is the strongest predictor of students' feelings of being prepared for the next grade. Again, a controlling for all the various and complex relationships in the model. Number one is social support. Number two is that interest in school cognitive engagement measure. Instruction, none of the instructional questions really pop up all that much on the preparedness outcome. But the instruction in math does drive that interest in school and cognitive engagement. Um, overall, when I'm talking about all 15,000 surveys analyzed, it's really social support is the number one thing that's going on here. And interestingly, when we break it out at the different school levels, at the elementary level, social support and interest engagement in school are the two strongest. At middle school, social support and interest and engagement, again. Um, in high school, social support is still strong, but this instruction in math and instruction in LA emerge as somewhat of a stronger driver, which I found to be very interesting. But the consistency of this, the strength of the social support construct on this outcome of feeling prepared for what's next, I found to be quite interesting. Um, you can see what another interesting component to this. The social support construct, there is a lot more variation on this measure than there is in some of the other measures I've shown you. So that graph on the left is a distribution of the means. And before we were seeing everybody had threes and fours. Here you can see there's a lot of threes and there's a lot of twos and there's even a lot of 1.5s. So there's a lot more variation in social support, but social support is the number one strongest predictor of the outcome that we're looking at today. And so there's a lot of room to sort of think about moving more of that left-hand side of that distribution over to the right-hand side. Again, interest in school, that's another one of the strong drivers that had quite a bit of um, variation and quality of instruction in math. I wanted to try to summarize what is it all, what is, what is all of this show across employee, parent, and student. And so first I did this, and this is very precise, and I was kind of 
feeling unfulfilled. <laughs> so I said, if, I, if I'm going to lose precision and lose the scientific <coughs> approach, but just kind of step back from it, what do I see? And so this is what I see. Maybe you see something similar or something different. But I see that for employees, if you remember, that safety construct was really strong for them and the management of behavior in their classrooms, not taking away from instructional time. And that supportive environment um, and respect for each other, interpersonal respect, was very important. For parents, it was being respected um, from, and, and teachers showing respect to their students and communication from the school. And for students, it's all about this sort of social support and feeling belonging and feeling like your teachers respect you. And I thought that was a really interesting kind of takeaway, that, that, that interpersonal support and respect is critical for all three populations that we collected data from and, and analyzed data for. And I mean, I could write five slides about next steps. There's lots you can do. Um, we've, given, there, we've given you tons of data. There's a lot of um, descriptive data behind this. Those scorecards, I don't have any with me, but um, that we've given you every year, the school level scorecards of the student results, that you, those have been submitted as well. There's Excel spreadsheets everywhere with filters everywhere. If you want to see how a certain school did, a certain um, performance by um, a grade level. And so there's a lot you could dig into, but I'm, I'm sort of going to turn the floor over to you to ask me questions and see what, um, what you think actually would be the most in important next step. One thing that it would be time to start thinking about is, if we're going to do this again for 1819, it's time to start thinking about what don't you know from this that you maybe want to know, and can we add any questions or change any questions? That's all I got. Wonderful. Voluminous amount of information. Uh, <laughs> thank you guess. for uh, doing your best to boil it down into tangible uh, <laughs> bites for us uh, to try to look at this and, and ask some questions. Um, are there trustees that have questions? I know there are. Okay. Go ahead, Ms. Walton. Oh, thank you, Dr. Reich. Um, touching sort of on something you just said, uh, that this, all, this is broken down by campuses. So, uh, for example, on communicating with parents, um, it seems to be working in some places, but not working in other places. Is that kind of is that a yeah? So you can normal look thing to derive from this. Yeah. So when it whether it's working well or not working well, mm -hmm. in both situations, it's very important for parents to be satisfied. So if it's working well, parents are more satisfied. If it's working not as well, parents mm -hmm. are probably exactly. more satisfied. Exactly. Exactly. Um, there are other variables for which you do have that variation, but it's not as important for driving satisfaction. Right. Um, so yes, you have, or I should say, Dr. Barlow has, um, you can look at all the schools. And what I think is really useful is to dive into those schools on the lower end of the range and see maybe there's room for improvements there. And even borrowing best practices from the schools that are on the top mm -hmm. in terms of the. Yeah. I mean, that seems like a very tangible thing yeah. that you could, that could be uh, mm -hmm. improved. Yeah, definitely. That's my only question at this point. Go ahead, Dr. Kvassos. And, and to the credit of the team, uh, Ms. Walton, that's that's precisely what we set out to accomplish is what are those tangible things that research-based and done in a very smart way mm -hmm. um, so that we can actually have some improvement and be able to specifically point out this is the area that would make a big difference in this case for satisfaction. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chapa. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Reich. I, one of my questions, uh, looking at the student results for safety, mm -hmm. I know that this tells us sort of the magnitude of what a driver is, mm -hmm. but so do I take away from this data that our students generally feel safe? Is that something that you can speak to, or does this just tell me whether or not it's something that they find important? So that's a very good distinction. I can tell you from somewhere that I have to look in my notes whether or not they feel safe. There's, you know, there's a mean score on safety. I can tell you if it went up or down from last year. Um, I, I can tell you the level of safety. What these results are telling you is that it's not a critical driver for whether or not they feel prepared for the next grade. And, and is that the only outcome that your work addressed? 
I love that you asked me that question because right now it is for students, but what I really would love to do is explore this model with different outcome variables. So what and are other things we could look at as okay. an outcome? So do you find that this outcome variable would actually give us a robust enough indication of whether students feel safe on campus or is, is you know saying whether or not they're prepared for the next grade to me doesn't seem like something that would tell me whether or not students feel safe. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, and you're right. It's two totally different questions. I did have a backup slide with the safety results, but apparently it's gone. Um, so I don't have the distribution of safety items here. But it's something I can send to you. Okay. I, I'd be interested in seeing that because that was something that I, I was noticing, and I, I seem to recall hazily last year's yes. presentation yes. that data that we received on how students felt in terms of safety on campus was, yep. was much more granular. And so I would yes. be interested in knowing whether we went up or down, where there's pockets of, of students who feel unsafe. And, and from the, the qualitative responses we got, if they do feel safe or unsafe, why? Uh, I'd be interested in seeing that. So I think you're raising two really important things. Number one is I think we should, I think it's the perfect time to revisit what we ask students in the open-ended for next year. Um, right now, we don't have an open-ended question that asks them about safety, um, but we do have these scorecards, and there's one for 6th grade, 8th grade, 10th grade, and 12th grade, and they show, like, for instance, the district-level average safety score on a scale of 1 to 4 um, this year for 6th graders was 2.7, which is exactly the same as what it was last year. Um, and we can, you know, it was 2.5 for 8th grade and 2.6 for 10th grade, um, so we have all that data exists, um, but again, I think that there's there's also the safety construct is an average of a bunch of items about safety. If you remember from prior years, we've come in with, um, do you feel safe in the hallway? Do you feel safe in the bathroom? Do you feel safe? And we have all that data, um, and I'm happy to compile it in a way and, and send it to you. But it's it's in this model, it's not coming out as critical for knowing whether or not the students are feeling prepared for for the next grade, which again is a very narrow sort of focus of what this analysis is designed to do. Okay. And those are the only questions I have for now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chapa. Any other trustees have questions? So I have uh, a, a question on the, uh, the, the aggregate of, of showing uh, the, the support and respect uh, and, and interest engagement going through all, all spectrums of, of uh, schools, uh, the, the difference with the high school with the math and the ELA mm -hmm. instruction. So is that just a, a, an indicator that they feel that that is important or did that come out as they felt that it was positive or they felt that it was negative in high school? So not the latter. Okay. Um, for sixth graders, how they respond about their instruction in their math class is not related to how they respond about feeling prepared for next grade. Mm -hmm. In 10th and 12th, how they answer questions about math actually is related to how they answer questions about whether or not they feel prepared for the next grade. Even if they don't realize that they're doing that, they're, so kids who are scoring higher are more prepared, kids who are scoring lower are feeling less prepared, but only in math. It's a little bit in LA, but it's not in science or social studies, and it's not in sixth grade or eighth grade. Okay, so there, there's nothing to to point that the overall kids are feeling that they're getting adequate instruction. No, in fact, the quality of instruction, they're, they're, um, the, the, the average level of the, of the variable is quite high. I think this is it. Let me show you this graph one more time. So on a scale of one to four, can you see that? Yeah, it's on our screen here. Okay. Um, there it is, over there. So it's a little bit lower than what we were seeing with the satisfaction outcome and the preparedness outcome, which was really high. The average is 2.8, 2.8, 2.7 for elementary, middle, and high. So there's definitely room for improvement there. You can see the distribution. I mean, I look at a histogram, and I know exactly what it means, but I realize it's not intuitive to everybody. If you see, so that's, that's mm -hmm. it's a scale score, so it's continuous measure, so it runs from one to four. Those, the number of people with that score um, on the left-hand side, m the majority of people in, the majority of students have a score of 
between 2.5 and 3.5 on instruction in math, which is a little bit lower than the other constructs that we were looking at where everybody was three and four. Right. Um, so there's definitely some room for improvement, but it is not because it is lower that it's the driver. Right, right. And, and at the same time, uh, Dr. Vasos, you'll, you're probably looking at this data at the campus level to see the, the ones that are, are very high that are in that the, the four range uh, to see what they're doing and how they're approaching to uh, inform the other campuses that maybe have opportunities there. That's great. Great. This is uh, amazing information. Uh, Looking forward to what uh, what is yet to come. Uh, there's, as you said, there's a, a lot of drill down, a lot of ways to uh, uh, analyze this. Um, I don't. Let me see. Last call, trustees. Anybody else have questions? All right. So can you, uh, I guess, tell us uh, uh, the the. The timeline, the, the next steps, uh, this was uh, this level of analysis. Uh, what will you be providing as, as Gibson versus Dr. Barlow in the district uh, for the, the next phase of analysis of these results and then moving forward with uh, the, the surveys uh, to come? Do you want to start? So our thought process right now is what we wanted to do is we wanted to establish that model of those drivers because we had to have an understanding of those drivers before we really can determine what areas to work on in order to drive satisfaction or to affect satisfaction. So now our next step, a couple of next steps, one of them would be to start working with campuses and other uh, administrators and so forth with respect to explaining the model, making sure that they can see their results, as several of you indicated, with respect to campus results, mm -hmm. uh, getting that out to campuses so that they can understand that and see those uh, uh, areas that they can uh, effect in order to affect satisfaction. Now that we have the model in place, and certainly we'll do a little bit of tweaking for next year, it should run a little bit quicker and smoother as we go through the spring, you know, trying to get everything together and trying to understand the model and all the research that they did with respect to what goes into the model and so forth. That All that legwork has been done now. So we feel, uh, feel pretty uh, comfortable with, uh, as we move into spring, we'll be able to go through the uh, analysis again or the survey again get results out even a little bit quicker uh, with principals next year and so forth so that we can actually see the effect that they're having. Sure. Okay. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate that. And the, the final thing that I would say is on the, the, the numbers are very impressive uh, for the, the numbers of uh, uh, parents and uh, students as well. Uh, the overall student numbers uh, very comparable. Uh, they are lower uh, 2018 versus 2017. And I would ask if... Uh, if you have or are considering looking at that from a percentage standpoint versus just a raw number N, uh, uh, adjusting for maybe changes in enrollment, uh, that maybe that number is even tighter than it already is. I don't know if that's something you've looked at or not, but just a, a In thought. terms of the student response rate? Yeah. Yeah. It was a, like a one percentage point lower this year, I think. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you very much. appreciate all the information and, and this uh, very important work informing how we're moving forward to address Thank ultimately you. achievement. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, we will now move to our uh, discussion item B, the 1920 school calendar update. Dr. Cavazos. Thank you, President Rice. And this evening, we'd like to uh, update the board on the calendar development process and also uh, kind of some of the options that have been developed. and. You know, I'll say, and, and we'll have time for discussion as well, obviously, but I'll say that the, the calendar is one piece of a big puzzle uh, in terms of making sure that students have the instructional time, uh, the teachers have planning time. Uh, it is one piece, but it's a very important piece. Uh, I think it continues to be um, uh, kind of moving in the right direction, especially providing stability with the calendar, uh, that we're not every year discussing, talking about adding time or this type of planning time for teachers, et cetera, that we're actually trying to stabilize that over, in this case, two years of time. I think with the uh, surveys also and the opportunity to ask not only uh, staff but uh, parents as well, I think that's important as we establish a calendar. Uh, so this gives us an opportunity to do it early as well 
And Mr. Hill, I think your committee continued on from last spring uh, into the end of the year and the beginning of this year. Uh, so I, I thank them ahead of time uh, because that is a, uh, an interesting committee to serve on uh, in terms of the feedback and input and things like that. They pour a lot of dedication to that. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll turn it over to Mr. Hill and, and uh, so you can present our calendar options this evening. Okay. So thank you, Dr. Cavazos, for the introduction and kind of segues right into the presentation and uh, President Reich and Board will get right into it. Uh, boy, this is bad. Let's see. <laughs> The uh, process, <laughs> I want to start again by thanking the committee, and I wanted to put their names up there in there. Uh, again, this is the committee that uh, created the current school year's calendar, and the board, at your discretion, wanted to keep that same committee in place uh, to come forward and work on the 1920 calendar, and so uh, that's where we are. So you'll see some of the meeting dates here that go back from December of 2017 all the way up through last Thursday, and there's uh, going to be more meetings uh, as a result of the uh, surveys that we're going to conduct. So some of the things that we uh, consider as we're going into the, in reviewing calendars as a result of House Bill 2016 that came out of the 85th session uh, went from uh, days to minutes and now there's a requirement of 75,600 minutes and at one point it was minutes of instruction or well, that changed and now it's minutes of operation and so we uh, make sure that the calendar committee understands that. Calendar must include two, two weather makeup days or enough minutes to cover uh, two weather makeup days. Uh, the early release days must be uh, at least 240 minutes or four hours. That's a requirement by House Bill 2610. The education code requires a few things that I want to make sure that the committee understood and that everyone else understands is that uh, the school districts may not begin instruction for students prior to the fourth Monday in August. But because of our District of Innovation status, we are exempt from that requirement. Uh, another part of the code says that school districts may not uh, schedule a last day of instruction for students prior to May 15th, uh, regardless of the number of minutes you go. A school day shall have at least seven hours, and a teacher employment contract must be 10 months or a minimum of 187 days. So we wanted to make sure that that foundation is set as we went through. Some of the things that we, the committee considered uh, more planning and professional development time for teachers, ending school in May for students, uh, maximizing the use of those operational minutes versus instructional minutes as was a previous requirement, the early release for planning at the elementary level as well as the semester exams at the secondary level. And again, there's a lot of discussion about providing a calendar option uh, for two years uh, at this time. This is a summary here. You can't uh, see it on the, on the display, but you have a copy of it. Uh, and in summary of the options, the exchange days uh, have been moved to June in one of the options. More planning time again for teachers uh, and preparation time maximizes the use of those operational minutes again. Uh, and this is kind of a repeat of those uh, previous slides. The next couple of slides you'll see are the options. And this is a kind of a worksheet that I've created to make sure that we can capture the number of minutes and you can see it a little bit better there. But that summary is a summary of these. And so the option A, which would uh, give us basically uh, start on a Wednesday, uh, it extends the school day by 10 minutes, 445 minutes per day. Again, uh, it gives us uh, the same uh, winter break, spring break, uh, Thanksgiving break, uh, all the other uh, non-student non days are in there as is in the current calendar. And it gives three teacher days at the end of the year uh, for where we would uh, not have students. The student's last day in that option would be uh, May 28th, I believe. But uh, in order to honor the 187-day contract requirement, the teachers would have to go through June 2nd. And so that's option A. Again, there are. Uh, early release days that are separate from elementary and secondary because of that planning time and uh, the opportunities for some uh, teacher development throughout the year basis, I'm sorry, versus uh, at the end of the year. The next slide looks at option B. Option B, start school on a Monday. It is uh, August 19th. Uh, it extends the school day by 10 minutes. And this one gives us seven days on the front end, seven days prior to, for teachers, for planning, staff development, and whatever else we have prior to school starting. 
Uh, this one spreads out two days, one in October and one in April, and those days are placeholders at this time because uh, we're waiting uh, to make sure that it meets with state testing calendar, the academic assessment calendar, and the other academic calendars to make sure that those are in the right place. But we got a good understanding or good feeling that they are the right place, but I just want to make sure that we understand that if testing calendars move or whatever, uh, and that we may have to make some adjustments there. The other dates are the same. Again, if you'll look in November where we had those exchange days, we've moved those exchange days to June, and now uh, the students and the teachers would end in option B on May 29th. And then uh, option C, which is uh, the third option that the calendar committee considered, is just a repeat of the current year. No extension of minutes. Uh, we start on a Monday, five days for teachers before, and it's just a rolling forward of the current dates of the current 18-19 uh, calendar. The uh, next steps would be for us to uh, survey staff members, survey parents, and uh, we anticipate with Gibson's help, they ran out of the room on us, but we've got them on the hook already. <laughs> Uh, we anticipate that they would uh, have this calendar survey out to parents and, and uh, teachers Monday, no later than Tuesday. I just want to give them a little time, but uh, we anticipate Monday, uh, and we would have it out uh, to staff and, and to parents and give them uh, about six to seven days to give us some feedback on that, and then we'd take all that feedback back to the calendar committee to review those uh, options and that feedback and then re review by administration and ultimately uh, we'd bring it back to the board for a recommendation probably later this month or early December. <coughs> With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have about the options or the process. Uh, well, thank you for the, uh, the, uh, the information, the presentation, uh, the, the, the spreadsheets going through all of it. <laughs> Quite a lot of detail there. Uh, there are uh, trustees that have questions at this time. Mrs. Fowler, go ahead. Yes, thank you, President Reich. Uh, Mr. Hill, can you explain to me, is it just terminology or is there a difference between operation and instruction? There is. And so operation basically means from the time the school day starts until the time the school day ends. Okay. Previously, House Bill 2610 said that it was instructional minutes, which only meant teaching time. It didn't mean transition time in the morning, transition time, <coughs> transition time at the end of the day. Okay. So th that was a challenge for school districts, and then so they changed that to just say in, uh, operational minutes, and you could include all of that. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mrs. Fowler. Ms. Walton? Thank you, Dr. Reich. <clears throat> um, Mr. Hill, this will come as no surprise to anyone. Uh, I have been concerned for a while that our elementary teachers during the day are not getting enough time without students to do all that's required of them to do uh, as far as meetings and PLCs and, and so forth and so on. So how would any of these options help elementary teachers? So we'll uh, look at option A. We'll just go through them one by one. Option A, I think, would help in a way that it provides the, the seven days at the beginning of the year, not during the year. And again, I think one of the other options provide that. But the extra 10 minutes that are added in option A, we can put those minutes wherever. They don't have to be instructional minutes. Uh, it can be operational minutes. It can be wherever we... Uh, the campus decides that's the best place for those minutes for the teachers. Again, it's only 10 minutes a day. We, we understand that that's a challenge. It's, it's not a lot, but that's one of the options there. And option B, uh, you see the days that are tentatively scheduled for October and, and April. Those days are where we would not have students in the building, and all of those days, all of that day, all those minutes would be for teachers and campus administration to do planning or whatever uh, uh, design work that's up necessary uh, for the campuses at that point. And then option C, again, 
it doesn't change anything from the current year. So it, it doesn't provide any more or less time than what the teachers currently have. Okay, so where are the days that you're saying the teachers, this will be all teachers or just elementary teachers? This would be all teachers, all teachers. And it would be option B on this draft of October 11th, that yellow SD day, uh -huh. and April the 13th, that yellow SD day. Those would be days without students that teachers would have uh, and campus principals would have to decide what, what's the best fit for those days. That's not doing a whole lot for elementary teachers day to day uh, as far as loosening up their time and the 10 minutes at the beginning of the day, I can't see that being a lot of help either. So why are we extending the day if it's not going to help our teachers be better teachers for their kids by giving them the time uh, and to do what they need to do without little kids in hand. And again, th these are the options that the committee came up with. Uh, that's the decision that, that's what we want more input from the community, from the teachers about is, what do you think about these options? Uh, which one of these works best for you? Uh, if you know, I, I don't know how to answer that question other than to say these are the options that the committee came up with. Ms. Walton, Dr. Cavazos has information. Just a couple of, of clarifiers there, because I think there's a lot of information here and, and it's important to kind of summarize some of that as well. So um, kind of big picture first, uh, elementary planning time is an issue. It, we recognize it, uh, there's not enough time. And so part of this, is not obviously going to be solved with a calendar. We know that. But it's a piece of that. In parallel to this process, there's a committee that's working on elementary planning time from the district with uh, teachers and, and uh, our associations, et cetera, to review the planning time that's available and what strategies to increase that planning time. Currently, we have some strategies. Again, none of this completely solves it, but in combination addresses the issue. We invest in uh, providing substitutes for extended PLC time for elementaries, so only elementary focus where there's uh, funds available for subs. Again, we can debate as to if that's the ideal, but that's one strategy. Uh, extended conference so that we capture every two weeks a planning time uh, that's built into some. That's what that committee is looking at. Are there some best practices? Are there some best ways to utilize that time? The other thing that they're looking at, and I'll credit uh, Dr. Jarko, he's leading that effort. Um, they're looking at when we do meet and when we do have planning time at the elementary level specifically, how do we best use that time so we don't duplicate, so we don't have to come back after school in some cases? So how do we best use the time? Because those are two different things. One is to have the time, one is to utilize it you know, appropriately that they have time and we're actually working on the work and not uh, duplicating mm -hmm. some of the effort. So that committee is reviewing that and coming up with best practices, strategies, recommendations, et cetera. In parallel, the calendar committee is also trying to, from their perspective, say how can we improve and extend some time for elementary. I'll point to option B as one example. Option B provides what we have gotten as feedback and we get it anecdotally, we've gotten it through surveys, we get it through committee meetings, et cetera. More time at the beginning of the school year, mm -hmm. before the school starts, before kids come to school. Option B, is just one example, provides seven days. We've gotten input about start on a Wednesday. So one of the options provides seven days with starting on a Wednesday. What was interesting about this, option C in particular, was that the <coughs> feedback the committee gave was that on that Thursday, Friday, that 8th and 9th of August, again, this is feedback, they're already there. They go, they, you know, if you go to a school on a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, before mm -hmm. the five mm -hmm. days that they yeah. come, they're mm -hmm. there. Oh, and yeah. so their More request yeah. in a large way is, can we just capture those days and get mm -hmm. credit so that we can, we can have other opportunities like end in May? So that's a real, I think, important option. And I'm pointing to B because it provides more of your, your question, uh, Ms. Walton. So option B also moves the exchange days. Mm -hmm. 
so that if you see those yellow uh, staff development days, those are planning opportunities that will be placed strategically with curriculum assessments and things like that, specifically for to address the planning time. This calendar also provides the early release dates for elementary, just for elementary, and two of them are just for elementary. Again, these are all pieces of that puzzle to address the elementary planning time. So I think that's important to get a context of. Calendar's not gonna solve it, we know that. Right. The committee needs to do work, I think, to, to put these things together, and I think we've heard that before, uh, to make sure that we continue to address the, the real concern of, of elementary planning time uh, in a way that, you know, and, and I, again, I credit Dr. Jarko for this with his committee of teacher representatives, et cetera, in looking at not only time, but what we're doing with that time and how much are we doing and asking that could be accomplished in a different way and different uh, situation. So I, that's, a, that's a really important point as well. So just wanted to add that context um, to, to this issue. Well, um, I know that um, elementary teachers have to make some hard choices about that planning time. Uh, the choice is I hold on to that planning time for what I know I need to do as far as planning and conferencing with parents and that sort of thing, or do I give it up so I don't have to stay after school and go meet with the principal about the TTAS or uh, a PLC or, um, you know, a million other things. So um, I, I, I applaud any anything that we can do to help our elementaries with this issue. They, they've been very patient, they're very dedicated, but um, I, I just can't help but believe it It contributes to a lot of burnout. And um, the, those with big hearts uh, that we really would like to keep and see blossom and continue with our kids sometimes have the hardest time uh, with this. And these people have families too. And little kids, a lot of elementary people have little kids that they need to pick up from the daycare at a certain time so they can't stay after school and do some of this stuff so it's it's something that i hope what we can address satisfactorily for them um and i, I if this is going to be a two-year plan or can anybody tell me we're through with extending days <laughs> yes, sir. So I'll help Michael with that. Uh, I mean, I so, uh, no, so in essence, uh, that's the reason for providing a two-year calendar is to add that stability to our calendars and continue to evaluate so that we don't keep having this discussion of extending days. I think it also gives us real purposeful time to continue this parallel process mm -hmm. of really looking at planning time and what we're doing with planning time, how much we're asking of people, how we can be more innovative about, you know, some campuses are accomplishing a good amount of planning yes. time. Combination with substitutes, <clears throat> combination with extended conference. It gives us time to run that process so that we don't keep having this conversation of extending uh, time. And that's the value of a two-year calendar. Well, thank you. Good luck with what, you know, with getting the survey out to everyone. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Walton. Mr. Chapa. Uh, thank you, President Rice. Uh, Mr. Hill, I'm just struggling a little bit with understanding the concept of instructional versus operational minutes and how in, with option A and B, it shows that we're if we go with one of those options, there will be a change in either the school start time or school end time, depending on which level we're at. If we're going to set, say for example, elementary start time at 8.10, according to this option, uh, the options here, instead of 8.20, is that when instruction will begin like it does at 820 now, or is it, how, does that, how does that work? So uh, thanks for asking that point of clarification. For, at the elementary level, moving the operational start time to 810 versus 820 doesn't change anything that they're currently doing. Currently, elementary teachers get their kids, and I was at an elementary this morning just to see it myself. Uh, they get their kids at 810 across the district and that's when the clock starts. Now they take them to their classroom and that 10 minutes is just kind of like transitioning, preparing for the day, putting backpacks away, getting prepared for the day. What this new law has said is that when we're changing to operations, we can count that time. And so that's the only change at the elementary level. 
Now at the secondary levels, we would have to extend their days, but at the elementary, no change. So how does that, how would we advertise that to parents? Are we gonna tell them that school starts at 810 or, or is we also gonna tell them that school really starts at 820 but we'd like you to be there at 810 or no, we, are we gonna say anything different? No, no, we would say school starts at 810. Okay. We would have to. Because if you're a parent like me, I drop my kids off at like 815, <laughs> if I'm lucky. <laughs> and so, really worried about you know what, what's in, what's in it for me but it, I think it I think so then what from the teacher's perspective is different about that why wouldn't an 810 start be the start of the instructional day if that's what we tell parents is that their their children need to be in class by 810 because it seems to me that if we're currently considering the 810 to 820 period as a transitional period then you're essentially going to have an 8 o'clock to 810 transitional period that's still not going to be counted as an operational start, and teachers are really going to start instruction at 810. So, how, I mean, how is that different? Can you ask it one more time? Yeah, so you, just, you said that the period right now, that things wouldn't really change much because teachers receive their students at 810, and instruction begins at 820, and we really just, it looks like that 10-minute window between 810 and 820 is a transitional period. But if we tell parents that school starts at 810, like we tell parents school starts at 820 now, then why wouldn't the instructional day functionally begin at 810 and there be a new transitional period from say 8 to 810 if that's what parents are told? Well, then I think... How do we stop that from... You're, you're saying that 810 would be the start of the operational day. How would we stop that from being the start of the instructional day for all intents and purposes? Well, I think you, uh, we, we, we set the time that we expect the parents to get the kids to school. and. It's kind of up to them to get them there or not. And if they are not there on time, then, you know, tardies are what, what we would address at that point. Uh, I'm, just, I'm still a little confused. And so if, if, if instruction doesn't begin at 810, then why would we count a student as being tardy if they arrive at 810? If right now they're not tardy until the, the instruction day starts. Begins. The school day would start at 810. Okay. And again, it's not about... A, what, what House Bill 2610 allows is that it's not about yeah. instructional minutes, it's about operational minutes. Right, so my concern though is, is that if we're gonna start writing tardies at 810, and we're gonna require parents to have their kids in the classroom at 810, and teachers are gonna have all of their students in theory at 810, then why doesn't, I mean in practice, the instructional day will start at 810, right? Yeah, I, I guess. So, we've, so we will have effectively extended the instructional day by 10 minutes but yet say that we're extending the operational day by 10 minutes. Does that make sense? That, that's my concern is that we've essentially backdoored a 10 minute extension to the instructional day. Go ahead, Dr. Faso. So just to add a little bit of context to this, so um, obviously communication will be very important in terms of when we start school at the elementary level. Uh, but operationally, the expectation would be that the, the school operates the way they operate now which is that they take their kids at 810 to the class and instruction starts at 820. Um, again, understanding that even today, there's transition and sometimes that starts a little later. Sometimes it starts a little earlier. But it's not gonna be our expectation that instruction start at 810 necessarily. Um, and, that's, and this is actually feedback from the teachers through different meetings and et cetera, and principals, but a lot of it from teachers yeah, saying, teachers, yeah. we're there, we, we transition our kids at 810, we take them from the cafeteria into the room, and why can't we count those minutes as part of this, for this whole calendar discussion that includes all the benefits in many ways that, that are spelled out here. And so we would be clear in our communication of you know, the operation of an elementary school, uh, but, but we don't anticipate changing that. What is happening today is what will continue to happen mm -hmm. is our expectation. Now, will that require a lot of communication and understanding, et cetera? Yes, and that's part of this survey process, et cetera, as well, is to say this is, this is the expectation. Um, it's, even that time between 810 and 820 is, is rather fluid even today, you know, um, in terms of organizing and how long that takes and transitions and specials and things like that. Um, what we don't want to do is over mandate certain things uh, and let them have a little bit of autonomy. But our expectation would be 
based on feedback that the operation would be as it is today. And I, and I understand that that's the intent. I did, my worry is just, you know, one reason that that 810 to 820 window is transitional is because the expectation set in our community is that students should all arrive by 820. And so in practice, it's transitional because that is the time by which most students arrive in their classroom. And so if we're going to tell parents school starts at 810, I just, my worry is that despite our intentions, that's just, that point will be moved up. And so I'm just having trouble conceptually wrapping my head around the idea that we move that, the point at which we expect all students to be in their classroom up 10 minutes. And we tell parents that's really when school starts, but internally we're communicating that school still operates as it does today. And that really the instructional day should start at 820. But if teachers have almost all of their students at 810, then my worry is that effectively teachers are gonna feel like their instructional day is starting at 810, even if we communicate that message otherwise for the simple fact that most of their kids will be in their room ready to go at that point. Um, but I don't wanna, you know, that, I'm belaboring that point and I don't, don't mean to. Um, the other question I have is, what was the committee's discussions? I, I hear a lot of feedback on the calendar every time you know, it, it kind of comes up. I see a lot of feedback from teachers saying something along the lines of, I just really wish we had work days at the beginning of the year where we can get our classroom set up so we can have that, you know, ready to go before sneak peek or whatever their campus calls it. Is, and I, I'm, is there a particular option here that best address that? And what was the sense of the committee's could you give me a summary of the committee's discussions around that particular concept? Yes, yeah, so I think a, a couple of points to that. One is that it was made earlier is that in currently in option C, where we only have five days before school starts, three to three and a half of those days is, is basically district <coughs> mandated uh, training, whether it be academic training, uh, safety training, uh, bloodborne pathogen training, all of that stuff, and just the nuts and bolts of getting back to the school. The other day and a half to day of that is when teachers have free time to just get in there, not, not free time, but time to go in their classrooms and prepare it and get it ready for sneak a peek first day of school. The challenge is uh, many times that's not enough time according to what the teachers are saying, are saying, and so they do come up the week before they work that Saturday and that Sunday, that weekend leading up to school starting. And so what they're saying is give us more time in that week. And so options B and A address that. It gives us seven days at the beginning of the year to do all of that same uh, training, bloodborne pathogen, safety, security, nuts and bolts, and two other days that we currently don't have. And that's where we would take advantage to provide that opportunity for teachers. Uh, the teachers really push on the committee, push for it in option B, as was stated earlier, we come up that Thursday, Friday before the five day report week anyway. So since we're there in the schools, the principals are on the committee saying the same thing. We're there, we ask to turn the air on and, and, we're, and we're working. So just give us, let us count those days. And so that's what options B and A reflect. Okay. Okay, thank you, that's helpful. Um, I, I do want to go back to the point I was I was talking about earlier, just for another point of clarification. It, it, I'm still confused on this concept of operational versus instructional. If we already consider our operational day to start at 8:10, then why do we need to move the official start time at all? Is that is that a state requirement that the official to yes the operational day can't actually begin until the start date? That's start correct. time. That's correct. We have to report our start and end times to TEA. And in that reporting, if we are any short of what's required, then I'm assuming that there are consequences for not meeting the required minutes, financial okay. consequences, I would assume. And then when you were responding to Ms. Walton's question, you mentioned the possibility that operational minutes could be spread out throughout the day. How would that work? So we only set start time and end time. What they do with those extra minutes throughout the day, that's it's kind of what, that's the, the flexibility that I was talking about. At, so the, at a secondary level, they could have an extended lunch time. They could put so it on the class period. They could Michael, put just, it on just make sure we were, we're clear on that part. Yes. That, could it, the 10 minutes is more secondary. The assumption here is that on this calendar, elementary, that's where their 10 minutes are. 
So secondary, when you get to 10 minutes, it's actually an extension. That could be for lunch. It could be passing periods, which in some schools would really benefit from that. Plus periods, which some schools have implemented and very successful. That plus period uh, implementation may not work because of the number of lunches, but with 10 minutes, maybe it could work. I think the whole 10 minutes and placing them where you need them and all that is more a secondary discussion. I don't want to make. I want to make sure we don't Good point. mix those because we just had a whole elementary discussion with the 10 minutes. Okay. And can you give me a little bit more insight on what the survey is going to look like? I know you briefly addressed it, but is it is it going to be like here are the three options, pick your favorite, or are we going to ask questions that might affect how the composition of those are are ultimately end up? So uh, our our initial uh, thoughts were to just kind of put the options out there, let them have some time to process it and look at it, and and pick one. That that's that's the initial thought. Okay, that, that's all the questions I have right now. And I thank you for your patience. And I, I'm just having a hard time wrapping my idea around operational versus instructional because it seems like in my head they, they're kind of all the same thing. Thank you. All right, um, I, just a, another question off of that uh, for, for clarification. So we can't have the start time officially at 8.10 and then a tardy bell at 8.20? to kind of appease and speak to, would, would that fly? <laughs> yeah. I think that's something we would, we would really want to verify before we just answer it ex okay. explicitly because as soon as we answer it one way, we find something that says you can't <laughs> yeah. uh, from TEA. But intuitively, it sounds like that would make sense and that kind of yeah. keeps things moving in terms of that. Uh, but I think we'll we, we need to check okay. on that. Yeah, it's I, a good I, question. I, yeah, I mean, okay, I'll, 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 I'll give you the, the floor in just a moment. That uh, uh, hopefully is something that, that can be worked out because I mm -hmm. think it will alleviate a lot of confusion. It'll be much clearer that it's essentially the same thing. That's right. Um, and most importantly, it'll have Mr. Chapa's kids on time instead of late. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it's all about. <laughs> uh, Ms. Walton, please. Thank you, Dr. Reich. Okay, refresh my memory. What is the tardy time now for elementary? 820. 820. It, it's 820. 820. Mr. Chop, 820. <laughs> okay. Um, and so we're still not sure what the new tardy date will be was what that last conversation was about, right? We That's would correct. hope it would stay, no, that it would move to 810, is that right? We would hope that we could do it at 820. At 820. That's correct. Okay. Um, what will the new tardy time be for junior high? So the junior high day would actually extend on the front end, and so it's right now starts at 855. It would now start at 845, mm -hmm. and then the tardy time would be whatever, I'm not sure the number of minutes it is past eight. The current window, it would be the current window okay so if it's 820 for elementary it would be 855 for junior high probably add 10 minutes to are you saying that the junior high start time right now yeah if we go to option a or b, a or b. Mm -hmm. I guess I should have prefaced that I'm sorry if we go to option a or b and junior high starts at 845 now um, will so the tardy will be at eight fifty five, is that correct? I don't eight. Have to. No, that's not right. Would be at eight, be nine oh five. I think it would be at eight forty five. Yeah. Well, tardy can't be at eight forty five if they start at eight forty five. Well, if you're not there when it starts, it's tardy. I, I, Ms. Walton, I think that goes back to the same clarification on the elementary. It's, it's the same thing. You're that's not the way it works minutes. in elementary. Elementary have 10 minutes to get into classrooms or something. And, and that's, the, that's, that's the whole essence of this discussion, right. is that it already happens that way in elementary. It doesn't happen in secondary. And okay. so we should count those 10 minutes. Is, is what the input from the teachers okay. is, hey, we're already there. We're, it starts at 820 mm -hmm. and they, you know, et cetera. Yeah. I got you now. OK, thank you. Understood. A uh, second part of my question is um, teacher hours. What are the teacher hours right now for elementary? I 
think they're 810. I would have to confirm that. That's what they used to be. That's what they used to be. Yeah, 810 to 340. Is that what they are? I'd have to confirm that. It's, they're looking it up for me through the teacher handbook now. So, Sorry, I don't have that information up here. No, it can't be 810. 40, 50, right. I'd like, I'd like to know what, <laughs> what uh, is going to happen to the teacher hours uh, on if we do either plan, if either plan A or plan B is chosen. And I think that may be a question that will impact how, um, how secondary teachers and parents and so forth respond to um, to which which plan they would pick. It would seem like knowing what your hours were going to be would be a, be a factor in computing that. Can I get my kids to daycare by that time? You know, will my daycare take them, or, you know, early, 10 minutes earlier? You know, all those, um, all those ripples that happen when you throw the sticks out there and try to pick them all up. We'll make sure we... Okay, and if, you'll, if you could send that to me, I'd appreciate it. Oh, gosh, I think that was everything at this point. Thank you very much, Mr. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ms. Walton. Um, I don't see any other lights. I, I do have a, a question. Uh, well, first off, a, a comment. Thank you for the work and, and the thoughtfulness uh, uh, going into this. Uh, the, the, the survey information um, will be uh, very valuable. On that note, will there be something, uh, will it be allowed to be able to take a link and post that on social media for parental uh, input, or is that going to be more of a controlled trial, so to speak? So we anticipate that it'll be more like our parent surveys and it'll be directly emailed and, and kind of okay. pushed out to parents okay. with identifiers. Is that? that, that that's the plan. Okay. Is to, it, it, it's not an open, you know, if okay. I don't have students in school and all this, I can take this survey. Right. It's going to be very driven, just like our parent survey that had and the same 12, with teachers, and staff. Okay. Yeah, teachers unique, as well. We'll follow the okay. same mode. Okay. Each unique parent and unique teacher will have a unique okay. survey link. Okay, great. And um, let's see. The uh, <coughs> one thing that I noticed here on options A and B, if there's uh, no closures that that uh, end date. <laughs> For the students is May 26th. Um, that's the day after the Memorial Day holiday. So was that taken into consideration? Because I would suspect that we're potentially going to get a lot of pushback there that we're not going to come. It's the day after the holiday. Why did we plan it this way? Did, did the committee uh, look at that? Uh, we did uh, have some discussion about that. And that's a function of the the requirements of the minutes. And so right. when you bank those minutes and you don't use them, we have the option to let kids out early because they've met the 75,600 minutes. Or we have the option to go the days that are on the calendar. Right, right. So, yeah, I was just curious if uh, w with that consideration, I, I can just, I can hear the community saying, couldn't you just squeeze it so that they were done? before Memorial Weekend if there was no closures. And I'm sure the answer is not with a huge amount of heartburn because I know the work that you guys all put into this. Uh, just a, uh, something that uh, kind of stuck out to me that uh, moving forward, we'll, we'll see what the surveys say. There are no bad weather days built in because we have enough minutes to cover. Remember, the, the, the requirement is that you have two weather makeup days or enough minutes to cover two weather makeup days, which is 840 minutes. And so if we have bad weather days, students don't have to make them up because if we go the full calendar and have bad weather days, they've gone enough minutes to cover two days. So do, so the, do they get out early then? Is that what we do? Is if we don't use any of those bad weathers? That's where on the summary sheet it says that if no closure, student end date could be May 26 because they banked all of those minutes on the summary sheet. On the summary sheet. Oh, okay. So it would still be May 26th. Mm -hmm. Okay, on A and B. 
Oh, I see what you're saying. Thank you. All right, so uh, just, uh, I know you went through this, so the survey will, will be up Monday or Tuesday, uh, potentially, um, and then concluded. About six or seven days, I think, through probably next Sunday, or it, we'll make sure that it's out there in enough time to give, and enough communication goes out to parents and staff that, hey, look for this, and we need your feedback. And then the committee will reconvene to go through that? That's correct. Uh, between then and the next the meeting, next at which point we'll hopefully have enough informed information to take a vote yeah. on a specific recommendation, a specific option. And I also want to say that it is, uh, I really appreciate personally the attention to making a two-year uh, <coughs> commitment uh, on the calendar. I think that will really help our our uh, teachers, our, our staff in, in planning uh, vacations, et cetera, knowing that they've got the stability uh, for a second calendar year. So thank you for uh, uh, taking that recommendation that we put forth. Yeah. You have something, Mr. Hogg? Yes. Go ahead. Yeah, let, let's be clear on the two year. We're still in a preliminary second year. We're, we're still going to vote on the next year things like that, but we're just trying to look farther out mm -hmm. to give some preliminary ideas. Mm -hmm. um, if something is needing a major change, especially in the first year of your making the, uh, some of these tweaks and changes, I think we have to be, as a board, willing to go back. Mm -hmm. So it's, we talked and make sure it's very clearly said that this is not set in stone, this is our preliminary calendar, and this is after mm -hmm. the staff feedback, which is a critical factor. You know, we just heard a survey discussion we get feedback from everyone on everything else, our staff and our community feedback to hear what they think about all these, uh, all the different input. And I think our staff knows how much we take their input. Um, you know, we look at those percent, she talks about 13,000 comments or, or something of that, you know, we, we take those comments. So it is a preliminary two year. I just don't want us to think we're locking in a two year set in stone, just sure. clarification. Oh, 100% and and we also have a, a legislative session in between now and then, which may completely change everything. You just never know. You have more minutes or less no. minutes. Who knows? <laughs> you just don't know. All right. I don't see any other lights indicating further discussion, so uh, uh, we can uh, move on. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hill. Appreciate it. All right. So now uh, we will move on to the superintendent's report, Dr. Klausos. Thank you, President Rice, to share uh, some information about uh, what's happening in our school district. First, our Cook and Education Center teachers spent a recent afternoon showcasing and training, uh, the training they received from the AISD Pre-K Academy presented by the Education Foundation uh, last spring. So the training geared towards strengthening readiness and improve the quality of instruction in pre-K Thank you again, as we, it seems like every meeting we thank the Education Foundation, but this was an, a large grant that they provided to train pre-K teachers and, and help us complete that uh, training uh, so that our teachers would have the resources and the training to serve our students. So they spent some time, the foundation members, uh, at Cookin and visiting classrooms, and it was very, very enjoyable uh, and eye-opening, I think, for our Education Foundation as they visited pre-K classrooms and, uh, and, and went through centers and things like that. So again, thank you to our foundation for their outstanding work. Next, I wanna recognize our October Teachers and Department Employees of the Month. Congratulations to Abby Kellison from Thornton, Juliana Ullman from Gunn, Nicholas Young from Lamar, and Allison Mendelson from our PEAMS department. And we would also do, as you can tell, a Department Employee of the Month, and we, you know, maybe they don't get enough or, or, or highlighted in many ways, our employees in the departments, but uh, Allison is in our PEAMS department, and PEAMS is extremely important in everything we do, from enrollment to funding to reporting and all that, so um, she was working away and, you know, didn't want to leave her computer, but we made her, uh, so, we, so we could take a picture and recognize, so Allison and her crew make a, a, have a great uh, department there. We had the official ribbon cutting ceremony for the Gene and Jerry Jones family field uh, at Workman Junior High last month. The facility with new lights, a new turf, a nice video scoreboard uh, was the legacy 2018 NFL draft project and, and we resurfaced the track as part of our bond. It is an, an, an incredible asset for our community but for our schools as well. 
Thank you once again to the Dallas Cowboys, Hellas Construction, City of Arlington, and the NFL Foundation. And it's the Gene and Jerry Jones Family Arlington Youth Foundation for a collaboration in this effort. We had uh, Bailey uh, versus Workman, um, and, and they were all excited about the, the space they were playing and, and rave reviews. Our technology and integration uh, department handed out uh, just over $1 million in transformation through innovation grants as part of our bond. Uh, 75 grants were funded for our employees from 47 different campuses. Uh, we look forward to their um, TI grant showcase, May the 20th. So if, if, uh, if you want to kind of see the culmination of what they did with their grant and their students and their projects and things like that, May the 20th at the PDC is an exciting time uh, and a showcase. Finally, our uh, parent engagement department brought together a large group of civic and nonprofit organization leaders for a luncheon at the Career Tech earlier this week. The group represents organizations that are so generous with their time and resources for our students. Uh, this group uh, was highly engaged uh, in our presentation and our tour of the Career Tech Center. Uh, every time that a group enters the Career Tech Center for the first time, they are very, very impressed with the things that are happening in there, uh, but most of all, with our students and our students and, and their uh, engagement at the Career Tech Center. So thank you to their staff for always hosting us. They're always kind of on, on the showcase there. Uh, but the Community Engage for Excellence um, and the PACE Department did a great job bringing these nonprofit leaders together. That concludes my report. Thank you very much, Dr. Kvasa. So are there any trustees that have reports this evening? All right, uh, seeing none, then uh, we will move on. Uh, before we uh, move to a closed session, uh, Madam Secretary, do we have any items to consider? Yes, President Brunch. Um, Polly Walton requested to send the hours for the teacher's work time for all three options. Mm -hmm. All right. Very good. <laughs> all right. It is... 10 o'clock, and we will now move into a closed meeting uh, pursuant to sections 551.071 or 551.072 through 551.084 of the Texas Government Code. Thank you.